Hey everyone, this is Raja and welcome back to this video. So in this video, you're gonna learn about all the essential C Sharp concepts needed to build games with Unity. This is a compilation of my most popular Unity C Sharp scripting tutorials. So I hope you'll really enjoy learning with me. So with that being said, let's get started. All right, so I'm gonna go really fast because we have to cover a lot of things in this short time. So let's do this. So here I have a 3D project opened and I have a cube right here and we're gonna do all our experiments on this cube only. So here I have a scripts folder inside that I'm gonna right click and create a new C sharp script. I'm gonna simply name this one test. Then I'm gonna go ahead and select my cube and drag and drop the test script on the cube. Then double click to open it in Visual Studio. So here our script has been opened. So first things first, we have these two functions created by default, the start function and the update function. The start function gets called at the start of the game when the game starts and the update function gets called again and again and again every single frame. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to learn to destroy the object. So in order to destroy the object, we have a function called destroy that you can call from anywhere. So we're going to call it from the start. So we're going to write destroy. And what are you going to destroy? We're going to destroy this game object with which the script is attached. So we're going to write game object exactly like this, not in capitals, game object in small capital like this. So now if we are calling it from the start, so it should get destroyed as soon as the game starts. So if I save the script and go back to Unity, now let's click on play. And when the game starts, as, as you can see, the cube got destroyed. All right. So our destroy function is working. So let's open the script again. Now we're going to learn to destroy it after a few seconds. So to do that, we're going to write a comma and give the amount of time we want to destroy it after. So let's say we want to destroy after three seconds. So we're going to write three F. And if you want to say float, you need to write F. So we're going to destroy it after three seconds. So in Unity, we're going to play and then wait for three seconds. Three, two, one, boom. And as you can see, in three seconds, it gets destroyed. So the code is working. All right, so our destroy code is working. Now let's learn how we can destroy it by clicking on it. To do that, here we're gonna create a new function. We're gonna name it void on mouse down. All right, so this function gets called when we click on the object with our mouse. All right, so here what you're gonna do is we're gonna comment this out by writing this double slash. That means this code is not working anymore. And we're gonna simply copy this, paste it here and remove the 3f from here. So now, whenever we will click our mouse on the object or the cube, it should get destroyed. So let's save the script by pressing Ctrl S. And here, let me go ahead and click on play. Now let me click on it. And as you can see, as soon as I click on it, uh, the cube gets destroyed. Click and it gets destroyed. So our mouse click is working. All right. So now let's learn how we can do that by using our keyboard inputs. So in order to use keyboard inputs, First of all, let's learn how to take keyboard inputs. To take keyboard inputs, we need to use the input class. Okay. And so we're going to say if input dot get key down key code dot space. All right. So here we are pretty much saying that if we press the space button on our keyboard, then what you want to do? We want to do this. We want to destroy the object. So let's copy it, paste it right here. All right, so now our update will check every frame if we are pressing the space button and then it will destroy the game object. Now click on play and three, two, one space and it got destroyed. So as soon as I press the space button, it gets destroyed. Now let's learn to use some physics properties in the project. So here I'm going to select the cube, go to add component and go to physics. And from here, I'm going to add a rigid body component. So now it's part of Unity's physics engine. And as you can see, it uses gravity. So it has gravity now. So if I click on play and move the cube upwards, as you can see, it automatically falls down due to gravity. So now we can use this rigid body and do anything we want with Unity's physics engine. And here we're going to create a new public variable, not public, just rigid body RB. And inside start, we're going to write RB equals get component rigid body. So here we are pretty much getting access to the rigid body that we have attached to our game object. So now we can do anything that we want just by using this RB variable. So in the update, instead of destroying it, let's add a force to our game object. So here we're going to comment it out. And now we're going to write, whenever we press the space button, we want to say RB dot add force. And what do you want to add force? We want to add force in the upwards direction. 
So for that we're going to write vector3.up and how much we want to add force? Let's say 500 amount. So we want to add a force of 500 amount in the upwards direction to our object whenever we press the space button. So let's save this, click on play and let's press the space button. And as you can see, as soon as I press the space button, our cube jumps because we are adding a force to it. Okay, so now let's add a velocity to our cube to move it in a particular direction. So in this case, we're going to move our cube in the forward direction. To do that, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to comment this code out. And now here, I'm going to, inside the update function, I'm going to simply say rb.velocity. So we are adding a velocity to our rigid body. And we're going to add a velocity in the forward direction. So we're going to say vector3.forward multiplied by, let's say, 100f. Or let's say 20f. So we are adding a velocity of 20 in the forward direction. So we're going to save the script. So now if I click on play, you will see our cube moves in the forward direction by this amount. And as you can see, it's already rotating. So we don't want it to rotate. So we're going to come to our cube, come to the rigid body, go to the constraints and click on freeze rotation on the X direction. All right. So now if I click on play, you will see our cube is not rotating anymore. Okay, so now let's learn to detect collisions with other game objects. In order to detect collisions, we have a function void on collision enter. Okay, and now inside this collision variable, we have all the information about the object with which we have collided. So here we're going to check if collision.gameObject.tag equals enemy. So that pretty much means if the object with which you have collided has an enemy tag attached, then we're going to simply destroy our game object. So this function gets called automatically whenever our game object gets collided with any other game object. Then it will check if the game object has an enemy tag attached, then it will destroy our own game object. So let's save this and go back to Unity. So here I'm going to create a new 3D object, sphere, and I'm going to put the sphere upwards. Then I'm going to add a rigid body to it, physics rigid body. So now it has a gravity as well and it has a sphere collider as well. And now I'm going to go to these tags, click on add tag, click on plus and add an enemy tag. Okay. Then again, I'm going to come to the sphere, select the enemy tag from here. So now it should detect collision. So now if I click on play, the sphere falls down, it collides with the cube and before that our cube moves. So, so before testing this, we need to comment out this line of code. So now things should be fine. So here we are back inside Unity. I'm going to click on play. The sphere falls down onto the cube. And as you can see, as soon as it falls down, the cube gets destroyed because the cube gets collided with an object which has the enemy tag attached. So our collisions are working. So now instead of destroying the cube, we're going to destroy the sphere whenever it collides with the cube. So let's see how we can do that. So here we are back inside our script. So here we are checking if our object is colliding with an object which has the enemy tag attached then we are destroying our own game object. So now we need to modify the code and instead of this, let's copy this and paste it right here and comment out this line of code. So now instead of writing game object, we're going to write collision dot game object. Okay. Just by writing this simple code instead of our cube, now the sphere will get destroyed. Now let's click on play and three, two, one, boom instead of destroying the cube this time the sphere gets destroyed because we have written the code in a different way okay so now let's learn to reload or load a new scene or new level in our game so if you go to file build settings you can see currently we don't have any scenes in the build so let's click on add open scenes so our first scene is in the build we need to create another new scene to learn this now we're going to go to file new scene then press ctrl s to save this and we're going to save it inside the scenes folder and we're going to name this level 2. Then click on save. So now we have a new level. Now we're going to go to the scenes folder and go back to our level, uh, go back to our game level. And we're going to open our script. So here inside the script, we're going to say if we press the R, then we're going to go back to our next level. Okay. To check that, here we're going to say if input dot get key down key code dot R. If we press the R button, then we want to load the next level. Now, in order to load the next level, here we need to import a new thing or use a new namespace. We need to write using Unity Engine dot Scene Management. Okay, so just by writing this code, now we will be able to use all the scene management related functions. 
so now here we need to write scene manager dot load scene and which scene we want to load within quotations we need to write level 2 and then a semicolon so now whenever we press the R key our scene manager will load the level 2 level in our scene so let's save this and go back to unity now this is the most important step you need to go to file build settings and click on add open scenes we have only one scene here let's go to our scenes drag and drop the level 2 and put it here so both of these scenes should be here before we can actually load them so now if I click on play it goes down the cube gets destroyed I'm gonna press R and as soon as I press the R the new level got loaded so as you can see this way we can load a new level just by pressing a key now let's go ahead and learn to display a text on the screen so here I'm gonna go to UI and create a new UI text element I'm gonna go to reset to reset its position at the center then I'm gonna go and change the text to you win I'm gonna go to go and select the rec selection tool and double click on the text then I'm gonna make it then I'm gonna go to the 2d mode and make it bigger something like this then I'm gonna go and change the font size and make it bigger and then I'm gonna change the text color to white put it on the center something like this now we have our text let's name it to win text okay now let's go back to our script so here first of all we need to create a public variable public game object win text and now whenever our sphere collides with the cube we want to we want to actually show the win text so whenever our sphere collides with the cube first of all we're going to destroy the sphere and then we're going to say win text dot set active to true so before starting the game we're going to deactivate the win text and when the game starts and when it collides with the game object we're going to set it to true so that it shows up on the screen so save this and go back to unity in the beginning we need to set the win text and disable it select our cube go to the script and as you can see it is waiting for a reference to the win text we're going to drag and drop our win text right here so now it has got access to it now we're going to click on play and as you can see when it will come and destroy it our win text will be displayed so this way we know how to check collisions and whenever how to actually activate or deactivate an object when some event happens okay so the last thing we're going to learn is how to move our cube left and right by pressing the left and right arrow keys so here we're going to create two new variables float x input float z input and we're going to create another variable public float speed okay so now inside the update we're going to say x input equals input dot get access horizontal and z input equals input dot get axis vertical so we get a value from the horizontal axis when we press the left and right arrow keys we get a value from the vertical axis when we press the up and down arrow keys now here we're going to say rb dot add force and we're going to add force in our three different directions so in the x direction we're going to add a force of x input x input multiply speed in the y direction we're not going to add any force so make zero in the z we're going to add a force so we're going to say z input multiply speed all right so now just by writing this simple code a force will be added in the x direction and in the z direction to our cube game object whenever we press the left and right arrow keys so now save this go back to unity here we can select our cube and as you can see it is waiting for a speed value let's give it a value of two for now let's go to click on play and if i press the left arrow key okay so first of all if i press the left arrow key our cube should move left so let's go ahead and turn up the value of the speed i'm going to make it about 100 let's say now if i click on play you will see all these things happen now if i click on left our cube moves to the left and it automatically rotates so in order to stop that we're going to go to our constraints and click on freeze rotation on x y and z three of these now if i click on play if I press left it moves to the left if I press right it moves to the right so now as you can see our cube can move to the left and right and if you want you can go ahead and adjust the speed value I'm gonna make it 50 let's say now if I click on play it should work fine so now as you can see it gives a better player controller setting so now is 
as you can see I can move our cube left and right just by pressing the left and right arrow key on our keyboard. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you really enjoyed by learning C Sharp Unity scripting in this short amount of time. So if you want to learn more, you can check out all my courses from the links in the description below and check out my other videos as well. So thank you so much for watching. This is Raja from Charger Games and I'm going to see you in the next videos. Hey everyone, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to this video. So in this video, we're going to learn about C Sharp scripting in Unity in just 15 minutes. Now this is part 2 of my C Sharp in 15 minutes series. So if you haven't checked the first part yet, make sure to check that out. And you can check out all my other courses and videos from the links in the descriptions below. So with that being said, we have a lot to cover and let's get started. So in this video, we're going to learn about a lot of useful C Sharp scripting functionalities that we can use while building games in Unity. Now we have to cover a lot of things within this short time. So we're going to go really fast. So let's get started. So first of all, we're going to learn how we can spawn a game object in Unity. So in order to spawn a game object, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and create a new 3D object, a sphere. I'm going to rename this one to ball. Now I'm going to add a color to it. So inside my materials, I have these colors. You, if you want to create a material, you can go to right click, create and new material from here, this way. And I have this material here. I'm going to slightly drag and drop it right here. So now as you can see, our ball has this color. Now I'm going to go and add a rigid body to it. So I'm going to go to add component physics and I'm going to add a rigid body component to it. Now if you click on play and if I drag my ball up as you can see it falls down because now it has the rigid body attached to it. So now what we're going to do is whenever our game starts we want to simply spawn this ball. We don't want it to be here at the beginning but whenever we start the game we have to spawn the ball. So in order to do that we also need a spawn point where we actually want to spawn our ball. So here I'm going to click on create an empty game object and I'm going to name this one spawn point. And from the icons, first of all, let's go ahead and reset its position. Now from the icons, I'm going to select an icon for it like this so that we can see where it is. And I'm going to drag and move it upwards somewhere like this. So this is the point from where our ball will spawn. So this is our spawn point. Now here I'm going to go ahead and create an empty game object and I'm going to name this one game manager and this is what we're going to do all our experiments on in this video here here inside my scripts folder i'm going to right click and create a new c sharp script and i'm going to name this one game controller all right so game controller so i'm going to select my game manager and drag and drop my game controller over it now i'm going to double click to open it in visual studio all right so now we have to spawn an object in order to spawn an object, first of all, we need to create a public game object, not game controller, public game object ball. So this ball object will store the ball reference to our ball game object. Next, we need a public transform spawn point. So this is the position where we are going to spawn our object. All right. So now here we're going to create a new function. We're going to call it void spawn ball and inside the spawn ball function we're gonna spawn our ball and for that we're gonna write instantiate and what do we want to instantiate we want to instantiate the ball game object and at which position we want to instantiate at spawn point dot position and which rotation we want we want quaternion dot identity all right so we want to spawn our ball at this position with this rotation that means with zero rotation so now let's go ahead and save this script go back to unity here in Unity, before we can use it, we need to save our ball as a prefab so that we can reuse it. So inside my assets folder, I'm going to go ahead and create a new folder and I'm going to call this one prefab. Now inside the prefabs folder, I'm going to drag and drop my ball right here. So now we can reuse this ball anytime that we want. So I'm going to go ahead and deactivate this ball from the scene. Then I'm going to select my game manager and as you can see, it has a slot for ball. I'm going to drag and drop my ball from the prefab folder here. And for the spawn point, I'm going to drag and drop the spawn point right here. So we have the ball and the spawn point. And now we need to open up game controller. And inside the start, we need to say spawn ball. So we are calling this function in the start. Now let's go back. And now if I click on play, when the game starts, our ball spawns. And anytime when I restart the game, the ball keeps spawning. Just like this. 
So now let's learn how we can spawn the ball when we press a button on our keyboard. So let's open up our script and here inside the update I'm going to say if input dot get key down key code dot space. So that means whenever we press the space button we simply want to call the spawn ball function. Alright, now I'm going to comment this one out. And now whenever I press the space button the ball will be spawned. So let's go back to Unity. And every time I press the space button, as you can see, a new ball spawns and it keeps spawning like this. So what we can do is I can go to my plane and if you don't have this plane, you can simply go to create 3D object plane and create a new plane. And I'm going to select my plane and from the X rotation, I'm going to give it a rotation of let's say 10 or minus 10. All right, just like this. So now you will see whenever I click on play, I press base button and a new ball spawns and it falls down. All right. So now we're going to learn how we can click our mouse on the, at a point and spawn the ball at that position on our screen. So let's see how we can do that. So open up our script and here inside the update function we need to say if input dot get mouse button down zero that means if we are pressing the left mouse button then first of all we need to get the mouse position. So here we're going to say vector vector3 mouse pose equals input dot mouse position. All right. Next, we need to do what we need to do is we need to change the Z position of our mouse. So we need to say mouse mouse pose dot Z equals 5F. All right. Or let's say 10F. Then we need to say vector 3 spawn position. So this is the position where you're going to actually spawn equals camera dot main dot screen to world point. And here we're going to write mouse pose. So here we are converting our mouse position which is in screen coordinates to this one that is world coordinates. So in order to use any position we need to convert it to world coordinates otherwise we cannot spawn the objects at the correct position. So now that we have got the position we need to spawn our ball at this position. So to do that I'm going to simply copy this spawn ball code, paste it here and instead of this spawn point at position here we're going to say spawn pose. Alright, so this is the spawn position that we have calculated from our calculations. So let's go back to Unity. So now you will see whenever I click my mouse, the ball gets spawned at that point. So this is how we have learned how to spawn a ball at any point where we click our mouse. Alright, so now we're going to learn how to change the color of the balls when they collide with this plane. So for that, here we're going to create another new script. We're going to call this one ball controller. Then I'm going to go to my prefabs folder, select my ball, go to add component, scripts and add the ball controller script to it. Alright, now I'm going to double click on it. Now here what we need to do is we need to check when our ball is colliding with the plane. For that we're going to call the void on collision enter function. So this function gets called automatically whenever our ball collides with any other object. So whenever our ball collides with any other object, we need to simply change the color of the ball. In order to change the color of the ball, we're going to say get component renderer and this will give us access to the renderer component of our ball dot material dot color equals color dot red. So whenever our ball collides with the plane or any other game object, we're going to simply go and change its color to color.red. You can simply go ahead and change it to color.green or color.blue. I'm going to simply go ahead and make it red. So now let's save this and go back to Unity. Now you will see I can spawn my balls at any point and whenever they fall down, they actually become red. So now you can see I can spawn my balls at any position and whenever they fall down they automatically change the color and they become red. So our code is working. Okay so now we're going to learn how to call this spawn ball functions repeatedly again and again so that we don't have to do anything and this function will get called again and again and the balls will get spawned again and again. To do that we're going to use something called invoke repeating. Alright. So here inside the start function we're going to write invoke repeating which helps us to call any function repeatedly. So first of all, within a string, we need to we need to write the name of the function exactly as it is. So I'm going to go ahead and select my spawn ball and copy this. And here I'm going to paste spawn ball. All right. So now after that, 
for the second parameter we need to write after how many seconds we want to start calling so let's say after one second we want to start calling and then we need to mention after how many seconds we want to repeatedly call it so let's say here i pass 2f so that means it will call this function every two seconds so after every two seconds this invoke repeating function will get called and the balls will be instantiated so this is the code we need to write to repeatedly call this function again and again so let's save this and go back to unity and here if i click on play now you will see i'm not doing anything i'm not clicking on my mouse or pressing my space button but all the balls are falling again and again one by one one after one and they are just going down all right so our code is working but as you can see all of them are actually spawning at the same position so they are not changing their position they are all falling at the spawn point so now we're going to learn how we can actually randomize the position and spawn them at any point that we want to so if you select our spawn point as you can see this is position here so we need to find a random point over this plane so what you can do is we can get a random position of x between this which is about 2.87 so let's say 2.60 so let's say minus 3 so we need to spawn it between minus x minus 3 to positive 3 in the x axis all right and for the z axis we're going to say from positive 3 to negative 3 all right so anywhere within this point we want to spawn this object okay so now we need to go back to our game controller script and here as you can see this is the spawn ball and we need to find a way so that we can randomly spawn this ball so here inside the spawn ball function what we can do is float random x so this will be the random x spawn point equals random dot range so at which range we want to spawn our value or spawn our ball so for that here we're going to create two new variables public float max x and public float max z so this will be the points which will which we will use to randomly spawn this so here we're going to write random range minus max x comma max x and for the second value we're going to write random z equals random dot range minus max z comma max z so now this will return us a random value between these two values okay and we're going to use that random value to spawn our ball so here we're going to simply copy this code and paste it here in here we're going to write vector3 random spawn pose this is a new variable equals new vector3 and for the x value we're going to write random x for the y value we're going to write 10f and for the z value we're going to write random z that we have already calculated so now what will happen is this will create a random spawn position and now inside the instantiate function instead of this we need to simply write random spawn pose all right so this way it is creating a random x position it is creating a random z position and this is creating a random vector 3 position which is taking the random x and z and finally we are instantiating our ball in this random spawn point and now as you can see in our start function we are repeatedly calling this spawn ball function so every time this gets called this function gets called and the ball will be instantiated at a random location over our plane so let's save this and go back to unity and see how it's working so now if i click on play you will see after some time a random ball is getting generated but the balls are as you can see all spawning at the same point and that's because we have not mentioned the maximum x and z positions yet so let's go to game manager as you can see max x and max z is empty so here i'm going to write three and here i'm write three as well so now if i click on play now you will see all the balls are falling down at a random value over our plane and all of them are falling down so this is how our random code is working so thank you so much for watching this video i hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot of new things so go ahead and apply this in your own games so if you want to learn more about c sharp and unity by building a lot of example games like 2d endless runner 3d endless runner and all that kind of stuff you can check out all my courses from the links in the description below so you can go to the description take the courses and learn a lot so thanks so much for watching make sure to subscribe and i'm going to see you in the next videos
Hey everyone, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to another video. So in this video, we're gonna learn about c -sharp scripting in Unity in just 15 minutes. This is part 3 of my c -sharp for Unity series. So in this video, we're gonna learn about a lot of things like player controller, player movements, playing audio, collecting coins, moving camera and all these things. So I hope you're really excited for this. So let's get started. So first of all, we're going to learn how we can move the cube using our keyboard inputs just like a player controller. So to do that, I'm going to go inside my scripts folder and here I'm going to create a new C sharp script and I'm going to name this one player. Now I'm going to first of all select my cube and drag and drop my player script on my cube and then I'm going to double click to open the player script in Visual Studio. So here in the player script, first of all, we're going to take the input and then we're going to move the player. So we're gonna move the player using the rigid body component. So first of all, here we need a reference to the rigid body. So here let's write rigid body in capitals, rigid body RB. So this is gonna be a reference to the rigid body of our player. Then here we're gonna create two new variables. We're gonna write float x input and then float z input. All right. And then here we're gonna create a new awake function void awake and inside this we're going to say rv equals get component rigid body so this will give us access to the rigid body component that is attached to our uh, player so that we can move the player using this rigid body all right now inside the update function we're going to take our inputs and we're going to store those inputs inside x input and the z input variables so here we're going to say x input equals input dot get access horizontal so this will return us 0 and 1 when we have pressed the left and right arrow keys on our keyboard now we're gonna write z input equals input dot get axis and here we're gonna write vertical so this will return us minus 1 0 or 1 when we are pressing the up and down arrow keys on our keyboard so when we press the left and right arrow keys we will get the inputs inside x input when we press the up and down arrow keys we will get the input inside z input now we need to use these inputs to move our player for that we're going to go inside our fixed update function so here we're going to write void fixed update and here we're going to first of all get access to the velocity of this rigid body and then we're going to set the velocity to this amount and here we're going to create another new variable we're going to write float move speed so we're going to move our player with this amount of speed okay so here first of all i'm going to create a new variable i'm going to call it float x velocity and for this i'm going to write equals x input multiplied by move speed then i'm going to write float z velocity and this will be equals to z input multiplied by move speed okay so we are getting the input and then we are multiplying it with the speed and storing the value inside this velocity variable finally we will add this velocity to our rigid body to do that we're going to say rv dot velocity this is the velocity of our actual player equals and this is a vector 3 so we need to write new vector 3 for the x velocity we're going to write x velocity for the y velocity we're going to keep it unchanged so we're going to write rv dot velocity dot y that means whatever velocity we had in our rigid body in the y axis we're going to keep it same but for the z axis we're going to write z velocity all right so now we have set the x y and z velocity for our rigid body so now our player will be moving when we press the left and right or up and down arrow keys on our keyboard so let's go back to unity and see if it's working all right so here we are back inside unity and you will see here we have the player script but the things are not showing up because we have not made them public so let's go here and make this move speed variable a public variable so that we can actually enter our move speed here so now we have made it a public variable let's go ahead and save it and go back to unity and here in unit you will see now we have this move speed field here we're going to simply give a speed value by which we want to move our player i'm going to write 10 here so 10 okay so now the final thing we need to do is we need to add a rigid body component to our player so here we're going to write add component physics and here we need to write a rigid body so now we have a rigid body component attached to our player so our script will access this rigid body and add a velocity to our player so now let's go ahead and click on play and you will see now i can move my player left and right using the arrow keys but the problem is that 
our player actually rotates but we don't want to do that so to solve this issue we're gonna go to our rigid body go to constraints and we're gonna set the freeze rotation we're gonna go to constraints and set the freeze rotation on x y and z axis so now our rigid body will not rotate so now if I go ahead and click on play you will see now I can move my cube up and down and left and right and it will move so now let us give more speed or more space to this cube so that it can move in a broader direction to do that I'm gonna select our plane and make the X scale to 5 and make the Z scale 5 as well so now our player will have more space to move so if I click on play you will see now it will be able to move throughout the whole plane like this all right but the problem is that when it goes out of view from the camera the camera will not be able to follow it okay so now let's create a way now let's find out a way so that our camera can always look at the cube to do that here I'm gonna create a new script I'm gonna write camera controller okay now I'm gonna select our main camera and drag and drop the camera controller onto our main camera now double click to open it Visual Studio here first of all we need to create a variable we can write public transform target so this is the target that we have to look at alright in order to always follow and look at the target here we can write transform dot look at and this is a simple function and here we need to simply pass the transform component that we want to look at so here we need to write target so now our camera will always look at the target and follow the target okay so now that we have done this let's go back to unity and see if it is working or not so here inside unity I'm gonna select my camera and here we have the camera controller and it is waiting for a target in the target I'm gonna drag and drop our cube which is our player and now if I click on play you will see wherever our player moves our camera actually looks at it as you can see wherever our player moves our camera actually looks at this and if you see at the scene view you can see the camera is automatically rotating to see the cube so this is how our camera is always rotating to look at the cube wherever it is moving but here sometimes you can see the camera can rotate around itself and it can rotate in certain way so that it gives us a wrong direction and whenever we press the left and right arrow keys our cube will not move at the correct left and right position to solve this problem what we can do is we can go to our plane and here we can move our plane at the front just like this so that our player only moves around this plane and nowhere else so now I'm gonna click on play and now you will see our player moves and our camera actually follows the cube around the whole plane and it doesn't rotate around itself and it gives us a good result to get a better result you can also select our camera and move it upwards somewhere like this so it will give us a better result so now you will see I can move my cube and our camera always follows the cube around the whole plane and it doesn't rotate around itself and doesn't give us any wrong results so our code is working and it is giving us a good result so this way you can create a very simple camera follow script with a very simple code now we're gonna create some coins so that our player can collide with the coins and collect the coins so let's get started to do that here I'm gonna go ahead and create a new 3d object a new cylinder and then I'm gonna double click to zoom in it so here we have our cylinder now we can go to our scale tool by clicking on this and then simply make it like this so now as you can see it looks like a coin now we need to rotate it around this x-axis to actually make it look like a coin to do that I'm gonna select the cylinder and go to the rotation and change the X rotation to 90 so now as you can see it looks like actually a coin now let's go ahead and rename this one to coin okay so this is our coin you can go ahead and add some colors to it or make it even more smaller on this axis you can go to materials and add any of the materials here or you can simply go ahead and duplicate and create a new material add it to the coin then go to the material change its color to something golden like color so that it looks like it's gold you can also change the different values like metallic value to make it look like gold so here we have our coin but the problem is that as you can see the Z X Y directions of the coins are flipped so if you want to rotate the coin or do anything with the coin you will face some issue to solve this problem 
you can go ahead and create a new empty game object name this one coin okay and drag and drop our coin inside this coin now that our coin is child of this coin let's go to our child coin and click here and click on reset position so now our coin will be a child of this coin wherever this is our coin will be there so let's select this one and reset its position as well reset position okay so here we have the coin so now our child coin is always at the same position as our parent coin and we can do anything with this coin so here we have our coin now we're gonna add a tag to this coin so let's go to the tag click on add tag and as you can see I have this coin tag added here you can simply click on plus to add a new tag and then go to coin and from here select the coin tag so now we have the coin tag added to the parent coin object all right now we're gonna go ahead and add component physics and we're gonna add a simple sphere collider to it so as you can see we have a sphere collider added to the coin now we're gonna select the child coin and disable its capsule collider you can also delete it because we don't need this we're gonna detect the collisions using the parent coin now okay so now we get to write a script so that we can detect collisions with the coin and we can collect the coins so let's go to our cube and double click to open up the player controller script and here we need to write void on collision enter and here we're gonna write if collision dot game object dot tag equals coin that means we have collided with the coin then we're gonna simply destroy the coins so here we're gonna write destroy collision small collision dot game object so now it will destroy the coin with which we have collided so let's see how it's working so let's click on play you will see here we have our cube here we have our coin we can simply go ahead and select it and as you can see as soon as it collides with the coin the coin gets destroyed that means we are now able to collect the coins now let's go ahead and drag and drop the coin inside the prefabs folder so that we can make it a prefab so now as you can see the coin is a prefab now we can simply duplicate it and position it on different places around the screen so I can duplicate it again and position it at different places so now we have all these coins and we can go ahead and collect all of them but what you can do is let's go ahead and add a rotation to the coin so that they look better to do that here inside my scripts folder I'm gonna go ahead and create a new C sharp script and I'm gonna name this one coin script so inside the coin script here we're gonna create a new variable we're gonna call this one public float rotate speed and here inside the update function okay let's do it in the inside the fixed update inside the fixed update function we're gonna simply write transform dot rotate okay and first of all we need to write uh, around which axis we want to rotate so we want to rotate around y so we're gonna write vector 3 dot up and for this one we're gonna write rotate speed so now this will rotate it around this y axis with this rotate speed okay so now that we have done this now we need to actually attach this to our prefab so as you can see here we have the prefab and here we have the coin we can simply go to add component scripts and select the coin script that we have created and from the rotate speed let's give you the rotate speed value of 5 okay so now you will see that here we have all these coins and all of them have the script attached and all of them have this five value that's because we have done the changes in the prefab if you if you don't do the changes in the prefab then they will not be applied to these coins so now if I click on play you will see all the coins are rotating and we can go ahead and collect any of them so let's go ahead and collect these coins one by one so collect this one let me go ahead and collect this one this one and now collect the easier ones from here so you have the easier ones collect this one and collect this one as well so now this way we have collected all the coins and all the coins are rotating as well so now we're gonna play some audio whenever our player collects a coin so let's see how we can do that in order to do that we need to have at least one audio source component and at least one audio listener component in our scene now our main camera already has an audio listener so we need to add a audio source component and we're going to attach it to our player 
So let's go to our queue, go to add component, go to audio and select this audio source. So now our cube has an audio source component attached. And here we have an audio clip that I have got from Kenny Assets. And I'm going to drag and drop this coin3 on this audio clip slot. So now our audio source component has an audio clip that it can play. Now here's a very important thing. As you can see here we have something called play and awake. We're going to go ahead and uncheck it because if we check it then the audio will be played when the game starts. But that's not what we want. We want to play it only when we need it. Okay. So now let's go to our cube and open up the player controller. And by opening up the player controller, we're going to go inside this collision. Whenever we are colliding with the game object, here we're going to say get component audio source. So we can we are getting access to the audio source component dot play. So now this will simply go ahead and play the audio which we have attached to our audio source once whenever this happens, whenever this event happens. So here in Unity, as you can see, now I can go ahead and select any of these coins. And as you can see, whenever I collide with any of these coins, the audio gets played and we collect the coins. All right. So our audio code is working and now we can collect the coins and an audio will be played every time we collect a coin. So this was a way by which you can attach only one audio clip and play it. Now let's learn how we can attach multiple audio clips and play any audio clip that we want. So let's see how we can do that. Let's open up our player controller script and here we're going to create a new variable. Here we're going to write public audio clip coin sound. Okay. Now here instead of simply playing it, what we're going to do is we're going to say get component audio source dot play one shot. So instead of calling the play function, we're going to write play one shot. And inside that we're going to pass the audio clip that you want to play. So here we need to write coin sound. All right. So now we're going to play the coin sound once whenever this event happens. And here we have the coin audio clip. Now only thing we need to do is let's go back to unity and here we're going to go inside the player script and as you can see it is waiting for a coin sound. So we're going to go to our assets and drag and drop the coin sound or whatever audio you have right here. And now you will see you can simply go ahead and touch these coins and as you can see the coin sound plays just like before. So this way the same thing happens but in a different way. And this is more flexible because now you can add any audio source that you want or any audio clip that you want and it will be played whenever you want to play it. Okay. So this way we have created all these things, the audio source, the audio listener, the audio script, the player controller, the coin moving script, the camera moving script and all these things. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you really enjoyed watching this. So if you want to learn more and build some more cool things, you can check out all my other videos and all my other courses from the links in the descriptions below. So go ahead and check out the links, build some more cool games and I'm going to see you in the next videos soon. Hey there, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to another video. This is another part of my learn c -sharp scripting for Unity tutorial. So in this video as well, within short time, we're going to learn a lot of new things. So let's get started learning without wasting any time. So first of all, in this video, we're going to learn how we can search and find different objects from our scene. All right. So as you can see here, I can simply go ahead and create a new 3D object. I'm going to name it a cube. I'm going to reset its position and then I'm going to position it right so that I can see it in the scene. Now I'm going to go to my materials folder and as you can see I already have created these materials from previous tutorials. So I can simply drag and drop this black material right here on the cube to make it look good. And if you don't have materials created you can simply go ahead and right click create and from here you can go to this material to create a new material. Alright. So now that we have this cube now let's say we want to create a script and from the script we want to find the cube and do then do something with the cube. Let's say we want to change its color or we want to destroy it. So it doesn't matter wherever we have this cube, we want to find it from our script and then do something with it. So for that, first of all, we're going to go ahead and create a new script. I'm going to create this new C sharp script and I'm going to name this one game manager. Okay. 
now i'm gonna create a new empty game object where we're gonna attach our script so because this script is the is a generic script that will work on our whole game that's why we're not gonna attach it to any particular game object okay so we're gonna create an empty game object and we're gonna name this one game manager or game controller anything that you want and then i'm gonna drag and drop the game manager script onto our game controller then simply double click to open it in visual studio all right now let's try to find out how we are going to find the cube so we're going to use a method called game object dot search or game object dot find game objects with tag okay so let's say in this seed we're gonna add a tag called cube to this cube and then from our script we're gonna find the game object which has this cube tag attached and that's how we're gonna find this game object all right so in order to add a tag you can select your cube and from the tag as you can see currently it doesn't have any tag so from here you can select this cube tag now in my case this cube tag is already created but in your case you can go to add tag and uh, suppose you didn't have this tag so you can simply remove them and then you can simply click on plus and from here select cube and click on save so now as you can see i have a new tag created now i can select my cube and from the tag select the cube tag okay so now it has the cube tag attached so now let's go back to our script and in our script here we're gonna say game object cube equals game object dot find with tag and for the tag we're gonna say cube and this is what you need to write exactly same as it is written in your tag otherwise it is not gonna work so this code will find the game object which has the cube tag attached and give us access to it inside this cube variable so now let's say I want to destroy the cube so for that I'm gonna simply say destroy cube all right so this is what it will do whenever our game runs this will simply destroy the cube and as you can see here we have the cube tag attached now when I click on play you will see immediately the cube will get destroyed but you will probably say that you can already do it using destroy function we can simply add a destroy function to this cube and destroy it directly why do we need to add tag and all these things so for that I want to say that let's say there are a lot of objects in the scene and all of them have different tag attached let's say there we have cubes spheres and cylinders from there you can simply select all the cubes because they have the cube tag attached and from there you can simply go ahead and delete them okay so let's see how we can do that with a better example so in this case first of all here we have the cube so I'm gonna simply duplicate the cube and position it here here somewhere like this duplicate it another time position it here here so now we have three cubes the same way we're gonna create a new sphere game object 3d game object sphere all right and now I'm gonna simply go to my materials tab and add this red material to this sphere okay just to make it look a little bit pretty so here we have our sphere we can position it somewhere like this all right now we're gonna go to our tags click on add tag from here we're gonna create a new tag called sphere all right now we're gonna select our sphere and select the sphere tag from here so now we have a sphere with the sphere tag attached and cube with the cube tag attached now the same way I'm gonna simply duplicate my sphere and move it around the scene so that we can distribute it at different places on the scene and use them or destroy them or do anything that you want with them so now as you can see we have three cubes and three spheres on the scene now we need to find out a way so that we can find out all the cubes and do something with them and we need to find out a way so that we can find all the spheres and do something with them so till now we have learned how we can only find one single game object now we're gonna learn how we can find multiple different game objects with tag and how we can store them so let's say I want to find all the cubes in the scene and then store them somewhere for that we need to create an array okay so here we are creating a single variable to store a single object but if we want to store multiple game objects then we need to create something called an array to create an array of game objects here we can write game object then a pair of square brackets and then we're gonna say cubes 
okay so this is an array which will store our cubes in the same way we're going to say game object pair of square brackets and then spheres okay so this is an array that will store our spheres so now inside the start function instead of writing this what you're going to do is we're going to write cubes equals game object dot find game objects with tag so here we're not going to use the game object we're going to say find game objects with tag so that we can find multiple game objects all right and here we're going to write cube so now what we'll do is it will simply go to the scene and find all the game objects that have this cube tag attached it will find them and it will store them inside this cubes array and then we can destroy them using a for each loop okay so this destroy function will not work here here we need to use something called a for each loop okay so what this will do is this will go to the array and search for each of the game objects and destroy all of them one by one by one so let's see how we can use the for each loop to use the for each loop we need to write for each then we need to write game object g in cubes okay now you can rename this g to anything you can name it c you can name it a you can name it uh, cube or anything it doesn't really matter so what this will do is this will search for all the elements in the cube okay or this will traverse through all the elements of this cubes array let's say we have three cubes on the scene so this array contains reference to three of the cubes now this for each loop will refer or traverse to three of the cubes and every time it finds the first second and third cube it will store its reference inside this g variable and then we can do anything that we want using the g variable so in this case we simply want to say destroy g dot game object okay so let's say it finds the first element in the cubes array then it will store the first element inside g and then it will destroy the g that is the first element then it will traverse the second element store it inside g then destroy second element and this way it will keep on going so here what we are doing is we are traversing through all the elements that are stored inside this cubes array and destroying them one by one by one all right now instead of doing this in the start let's see how we can do it when we press a key so inside the update we're going to say if input dot get key down and here we're going to say key code dot space now you have used these things a lot of times in the previous tutorial so you should not face any problems here so whenever we press the space key let's cut this code and paste it here so whenever we press the space button on our keyboard we want to travel through all the cubes that we have in the scene and destroy all of them one by one by one so this is it let's save this go back to unity and see how our code is working so as you can see our code is uh, attached to the game manager and now if I click on play you will see here we have all the different things and only the cubes will get destroyed when I press the space key so three two one space and as you can see all the cubes got destroyed because all the cubes had this cube tag attached okay now let's see how we can do the same thing for the spheres so let's go to our game manager and now we're going to say here the same way first of all we need to store the reference of the spheres so here we're going to say spheres equals game object not game controller game object dot find game objects with tag and make sure to write objects and not object i'm sure saying it again and again and here we're going to say spheres sphere actually so now we have access to all the spheres inside this sphere array now the same way we need to use a for each loop and do the same thing so inside the update we're going to say if input dot get key down input dot get key down key code dot let's say i'm going to say s so whenever we press the S key on our keyboard, we want to do the same thing. So let's copy the for each loop 
paste it here and instead of writing cubes here we're going to simply write spheres all right so now what we'll do, we'll do is it will get access to each and every spheres that is stored inside this spheres array and then it will destroy all of them one by one by one whenever we press the s key on our keyboard so let's see how that works let's go back to unity and now whenever we're going to press the s key on our keyboard the spheres will get destroyed and whenever we press the space button the cubes will get destroyed so maximize on play click on play and now i'm going to press the s key and as you can see all the spheres got destroyed i'm going to press the space key and all the cubes got destroyed so this way you can use this features to find and search multiple game objects on the scene and destroy any of them that you want anytime now let's see how we can do some more cool things using this tag functionality so let's say we have already learned how we can simply click on any object and destroy it now let's say i want to destroy certain object and i want to simply save other objects and don't destroy them so let's say i click on the cubes and i want to i want to destroy the cubes but i click on the spheres but i don't want to destroy the spheres and we want to actually write the same code and do the do both of the things together all right so to do that here i'm gonna create a new script and i'm gonna name this one destroyer and inside the destroyer script what you're gonna do is we're gonna first of all check void on mouse down so this function will be called whenever our mouse will be clicked over this object then we're gonna check if this dot game object dot tag equals cube only then we're gonna say destroy game object otherwise we're not gonna destroy the game object all right so let's see how that works so now we're gonna select all of our game objects and we're gonna add the destroyer script to all of them so let's say here i'm gonna select my cubes and my spheres all of them together by pressing the shift key so select the first one press the shift key select the last one and then drag and drop the destroyer script here and as you can see all of them will have the destroyer script attached all right and we're going to attach it to our first cube as well so attach the destroyer script to it now let me click on play and you will see whenever i click on the spheres nothing happens but whenever i click on the cubes they get destroyed all right so the same script is attached to all of the game objects but only the cubes are getting destroyed the spheres are not now we can also go ahead and change the script anytime so let's say i simply change this to sphere and as soon as i do that and go back to unity now you will see it will completely be changed now whenever i go ahead and click on it you will see now i can click on the cubes but they will not get destroyed but if i click on the spheres they will get destroyed okay so just by writing this simple code and this simple tag test we can do a lot more things so we can attach the same script to multiple game objects and let's say we click on we run the game and whenever we click on the cubes we want to turn them red and whenever we click on the spheres we have to turn them green so we can write one single script attach them to all the game objects and perform different actions on them depending on the uh, different things that we do so this is it this is all i wanted to show you in this video i hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot of new things so go ahead and use these skills in your new projects so let me know in the comments if you like this video and what do you want to see in the next tutorial and if you if this video helped you please hit the like button so that i can make more videos like this so thank you so much for watching this is raja from charger games and i'm going to see you in this next video soon hey everyone this is raja from charger games and welcome back to another video of this c -sharp scripting for unity in 15 minutes series in this video we're going to learn about invoke to call a function we're going to learn how to repeatedly call a function we're going to learn how to execute delay inside your code and all this interesting stuff so let's get started so first of all as you can see i'm using the same scene that we had in the last video because that will help us to learn these things easily so first of all we're gonna learn how we can actually find and search all the cubes in the scene then we're gonna destroy them with a delay using the invoke function 
So I'm going to go ahead inside my scripts folder tutorial 5. Here I'm going to create a new C sharp script and I'm going to name this one let's say tutorial 5 unity all right okay so here i have my tutorial 5 unity so first of all here i have created a game controller empty game object if you want you can simply go ahead and remove this one and create again so let me go ahead and delete this one create an empty game object and rename this one to game controller and I'm gonna drag and drop the tutorial 5 here. You can also rename it game controller if you want to. So let's double click to open it. All right. So now in the game controller, not game controller, in this script, first of all, here we're gonna create a new function. We're gonna call it void destroy all cubes. Okay. So we have a lot of cubes in the scene and we're gonna go ahead and destroy them. And uh, remember that all the cubes have a cube tag attached with them. So first of all, here we're gonna create a new array, game object, array of game objects, and I'm gonna name this one cubes. And we have already done these things in the last video, that's why I'm going very fast. And now inside the destroy all cubes option, we're gonna say cubes equals game object dot find game objects with tag cube. So now this code will go to our scene and search for all the objects in the scene find the objects that have the cube tag attached and it will get all the objects and store them inside this cubes array in order to do that we're going to use a for each loop so we're going to say for each game object g in cubes destroy g so now this code will travel through all the objects inside the cubes array and destroy all the cubes one by one by one okay now we have done all these things in the last video so if you are having confusion please check out the last video that is tutorial 4 uh, and you will have all these things clear so now this do this destroy all cubes function whenever I call this it will simply go ahead and uh, destroy all these things all the cubes in the scene so now we need to actually call it from somewhere so let's say I call it from start so in order to call it from start I can simply write I can simply go ahead and write destroy all cubes and like this okay so if i do this it will simply go ahead and uh, call this function and then we can do anything that you want with it okay destroyed all cubes doesn't exist in the current context okay so we have actually a spelling mistake all right so this works so this way i can simply call it from the start and it will go ahead and destroy all the cubes let's see how this works so let's go back to unity and here we have the script attached already so everything should work so let's click on play and now you will see whenever I call this whenever the game starts automatically all the cubes get destroyed as simple as that now let's open the script again now we can add some delay in destroying all the cubes or we can add some delay in calling this function in order to do that we're gonna use something called invoke we're gonna write invoke and inside that first of all we need to write which function we want to invoke so we want to invoke this destroy all cubes function so let's copy the name and paste it within strings so now it will call this destroy all cubes function or it will invoke this function then we have to mention after how much time we want to call it so let's say we want to wait for two seconds and after that we want to call this function so here we're gonna write 2f okay so here as you can see this expects a float value that's why we have written f explicitly to mention that we are going to pass a float value here okay so now we can simply go ahead and comment this one out and now we you will see that when we run the game this invoke function will call this destroy all cubes function after waiting for two seconds all right so now let's go ahead and save this go back to unity and let's see how this works so here I'm gonna go ahead and click on play and you will see it will wait for two seconds one two boom and as you can see it waits for two seconds and after that it goes ahead and destroys all the objects in the scene that means now we are able to use this invoke and add some delay in our code 
So now we're going to learn about something called coroutine and we're going to see how we can use the coroutine which is a more powerful way to delay our execution uh, and using the coroutine we can parallelly run multiple codes together. So we're going to learn how to use the coroutine and how to do the same thing more efficiently. Okay. So in order to create a coroutine, you need to simply write, first of all, let's write a name. So as you can see, in this case, we have written a function. So here we have written destroy all cubes. But here we're going to write, let's say, destroy cubes. Because we cannot, we are not going to give the same name. That's why we have written destroy cubes. And the same syntax is here. So we need to give a pair of parentheses and then a pair of curly braces. But as you can see, before the function, we have written void. Instead of that, before the coroutine, we're going to write I enumerator. Exactly same as I have written here. Okay. So you need to write I enumerator and now it will work as a coroutine. Now you can see that it is giving us some errors and that's really natural because it wants us to write an yield statement whenever we write a coroutine. So I'm going to talk about yield statement later. So first of all, let's see what do we want to do inside this coroutine. So inside this coroutine, the same way we were doing here, we're going to simply go ahead and actually wait for some time and then we're going to destroy all the cubes. So let's first of all copy the whole code and paste it here. So now the destroy cubes function is doing the same thing. It was the destroy all cubes function was actually searching for all the cubes. Then it was destroying all the cubes in the scene. The same way, this coroutine is also searching for all the cubes and then it is going to destroy all the cubes together. But as you can see here, we had to use a different thing. Here we have to use the invoke to add some delay. But in case of coroutine, we don't need to use anything explicitly. We can add the delay directly inside this coroutine. Okay. In order to add the delay, here we need to write yield return new wait for seconds and there inside this wait for seconds function we need to write how much time we want to wait so we want to wait for two seconds that's why we are writing two here okay you can also write 2f to mention the float value explicitly but i think two should work as well okay so now as you can see we have this coroutine and whenever we call it first of all it waits for two seconds and then it does all these things. All right. Now we need to call the coroutine from a start. So in order to call a coroutine from the start, you need to write this start coroutine function. Okay. So you can write start coroutine and inside that within quotation marks, you have to write the name of the coroutine. So let's copy the name of the coroutine and paste it right here. Okay. So that's it. So as you can see here, we have written this code and it will call the coroutine. Now we're going to simply comment out our invoke function because we don't need this right now. And now let's go back to Unity and see if this works same as before or not. So let's go back to Unity and let's wait for it to load. And then we can simply play it and check our code. So I'm going to click on play and you will see it will wait for two seconds. One, two, boom. So the same thing is working in a different way. All right. And now, as you can see, I have shown you one way to use the coroutine. There's another way by which you can call the coroutine. You can simply write start coroutine. And inside that, instead of writing destroy cubes in quotation marks, you can simply write destroy cubes with a pair of parentheses. And that works as well. So you can either write this syntax or this syntax both of them actually works. So now that we have learned how we can use coroutines to add some delay in our code, we can learn how we can use it more powerful in a more powerful way to add some delay in between the execution of codes. So in this case, when we are calling this function or when we are calling this coroutine, we are going ahead and deleting all the cubes together at a time. But now what I want is I want to delete each cube with a delay of two seconds. Let's say when the game starts, it waits for two seconds, then deletes the first cube. Then waits for two more seconds, deletes the second cube. Then waits for two more seconds and deletes the third cube. 
and this way it goes on. So I want to add some delay between each execution of code. And that's what we can do very easily using this coroutine. So now, instead of doing this, all we need to do is, we need to simply comment it out here. And inside the for each loop, here we're going to write yield return new wait for seconds and here we're going to write two. Okay. So now as you can see this for each loop actually runs for let's say here we have three cubes inside this cube array then this for each loop runs three times. So every time it runs it will wait for two seconds then it will destroy it will wait for two seconds then it will destroy again it will wait for two seconds and then it will destroy. So this is how this is gonna work. Okay. So every time within the execution of the for each loop we are making it delay for two seconds. So now you will see a very interesting behavior. Let's save this script, go back to Unity and check how this is working in our game. So now you will see that whenever I come here, let me click on maximize on play and click on play, you will see that 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. So every time as you can see when we run the code, it waits for 2 seconds and after waiting for two seconds, it deletes each of the cubes. So let's say I'm gonna make three more cubes in the scene. So I'm gonna duplicate this cube, position it here. Okay, now let's play. And now you will see one, two, one, two, one, two, and one, two. So this way, it just waits for two seconds before destroying all the cubes. So this is really, really awesome. And you can use this tool, use this functionality to do a lot more things uh, in your game. Now let's open it and learn a few more things. So as you can see here, we are directly saying that we want to wait for two seconds. Now let's say we don't want to mention it specifically here. To know, So we want the user to decide for how much time it wants to wait before it wants to destroy the cube. So if we want to do that, then we can add a parameter to our coroutine. So let's say inside the coroutine here, I can create a new parameter and I can call it float wait time. Okay. So now we have a parameter inside this coroutine, which is float wait time. And now instead of writing two here, I can write wait time. So now, Whenever we call this coroutine, we can mention what is the value of this wait time and depending on that, the coroutine will run differently. Let's say I pass the wait time value to be one second. Then it will wait for one second every time it runs. I pass it five seconds. Then it will wait for five seconds every time it runs. So now we need to learn where can we actually pass the value of this wait time. So we can pass this when we are calling the coroutine. As you can see here, we are calling the coroutine. So inside this destroy cubes function, we can simply pass the value. So let's say here we can pass two, then it will run for two seconds or wait for two seconds. Here if we pass five, then it will wait for five seconds. And that's how it will work. Now we can go one step further and add one more layer of this. So let's say, here we're going to create a new public variable and we're going to call it public float waiting time. Okay. And now inside this coroutine here, we can simply write waiting time. So this waiting time is a public variable. So whenever we run the game from the unity editor, we can pass a value to this waiting time and using that value, we can actually specify how much time we want to wait. Okay. So now let's go back to unity and check how this is working. So here we have our game controller and now from the waiting time, let's say we say one second. So now if I run the game, you will see it will destroy fast after one second. One, one, two, three. Okay. So it get destroyed after one second. I can also pass three seconds here. So then it will simply wait for two say three seconds. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And one, two, three. 
So this way as you can see, it will wait for 3 seconds and after that it will destroy it. So this way we have learned how we can use the invoke function and how we can use the coroutines in different ways to delay execution, to delay execution of our code, to delay execution of our loops and we can run the whole game loop using this uh, coroutine as well. And it is very very powerful, you can use it in many different ways. So I hope you really enjoyed learning with me in this video and I hope you have learned a lot. So thank you so much for watching this video. If this video helped you, make sure to hit the like button and make sure to subscribe to my channel to get more such videos. And let me know in the comments what do you want to know, what do you want to learn in the next videos. So thank you so much for checking out. This is Raja and I'm gonna see you in a new video tomorrow. Hey everyone, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to this video. So in this video, we're going to learn about c -sharp scripting for 2D game development in Unity. Now we're going to build a lot of mini 2D projects in just 15 to 20 minutes. So I hope you're really excited for this and let's get started. So first of all, we're going to learn how to move this object or this player using my keyboard inputs up and down, left and right, just like a top down 2D controller. So here I have my player. I'm gonna rename it to player and here I have the player script. You can right click, create a new C-sharp script and rename it to player. Then I'm gonna drag and drop my player script to player and double click to open it in Visual Studio. So now in my player script, first of all we need a public float move speed variable. So this is the speed by which our player will move in the scene. Then we need two float variables, float x input and y input okay so this x input and this y input will decide how much input we are getting from the keyboard so that we can move our player accordingly all right now we're going to do all our movements inside this fixed update function instead of this update function so you're going to write fixed update because uh, this will give better results in our movements now inside the fixed update function first of all we need to get values inside this x input and y input variable so here we're going to write x input equals input dot get access horizontal so what this will do is this will get the input from our horizontal axis and in case of our keyboard the horizontal axis is the left and right arrow keys so depending on whether we are pressing the left or right arrow keys this will return a value of negative one positive one or zero and using that value we can move our player accordingly to the left and right direction the same way we're gonna say y input equals input dot get axis and here we're gonna write vertical okay now the vertical axis for our keyboard is the up and down arrow keys or the w and s arrow key, w and s keys so whether you are pressing the up and down arrow keys or you're pressing w and s keys you will get a value between negative one, positive one and zero and you can move your player accordingly to that input. So now that we have got our inputs, it's time to actually put these inputs into our player movement. Now there are various ways by which you can move your player. In this case, we're gonna use something called transform.translate function in Unity. So you're gonna write transform.translate it just like this and this accepts a vector 3 value that means we need to put three different values for x y and z in order to move it in the x y and z direction now we want our player to move left and right and up and down so that is why we want to put values only in the x direction or x axis and in the y axis so for the x axis we're going to say x input multiplied by move speed and for the y axis we're going to say y input multiplied by move speed and for the z axis we're going to give a value of 0 all right so this way we have we have given a value to the x and y axis so that we can move our player or translate our player in the x and y axis according to our inputs that we are getting from the keyboard so now that we have done it you can simply go ahead and save this and go back to unity to check how it's working so here in unity as you can see here we have our player and here we have our player script now let's go and give a move speed of let's say 0 0.5 and we can of course change it accordingly now you can click on play and now you will see i can move my player by pressing left and right arrow keys or the a and d arrow keys to the left and right direction and i can press the up and down arrow keys or the w and s arrow keys to move it on up and down axis 
So this way we have created a player controller that can move to the up and down, left and right direction very easily by writing these simple lines of code. Okay, so now we're going to learn how we can move this player towards our mouse pointer. So wherever our mouse pointer goes, we want our player to move in that direction. So let's see how we can do that. So here's our player script. So here what you get to do is first of all we need to take our mouse input or the mouse position actually and then we need to move our player towards the mouse position or to the mouse position. Okay. To do that inside the update function first of all here we're going to say vector3 mouse post so this will store the position of our mouse and here we're going to say vector3 mouse pose equals input dot mouse position position all right so this input dot mouse position function gives us the value of our mouse position or wherever our mouse pointer is but the problem is we cannot use this value in real game world because this one is in screen coordinates so we need to convert it into world coordinates in order to use it in our game world to do that here we can write camera dot main dot screen to world point screen to world point and within these brackets we're going to put our input dot mouse position so the screen to world point function will convert this value from screen coordinate to world coordinate so that we can use it in our real game now we need to do one more thing we need to here say mouse pose dot z equals 10f or any value greater than one okay you can give it five value or anything that you want so what happens is we need to put the z value a little bit forward than our camera otherwise we cannot see it if the value is same as our camera's z position okay so we need to put our player or put our mouse position in front of our camera so that we can see it through the camera that's why we're changing the z value okay so now that we have got the mouse position it's time to move our player towards the mouse position to do that we simply need to say transform dot position equals mouse pose okay so here we are setting our player's position to same as our mouse position that we have calculated so now our player will always move towards the mouse or to the mouse position every time we run our game so let's save this and go back to unity and check how it's working so now as you can see wherever our mouse goes our player automatically moves to that point and that's how our mouse move code is working and our player is moving towards our mouse okay so now we can learn how we can move our player to the position wherever we click our mouse so let's say i click my mouse here i want to move my player here i click my mouse here i want to move it here so that's what we're going to do so let's see how we can do that and here's our player script so now we're going to create a separate function that will help us to understand how this works differently so here we're going to create a new function void click to move so this function will will actually control all the functionalities for clicking to move and we're going to call this function from our fixed update function so that this one works so inside this what you're going to do is first of all here we're going to create a new variable we're going to call it vector to target pose so this will be the position or the target position we where we actually want our player to move all right so as you can see here we already have our mouse position so here what you're gonna do is whenever our player clicks the mouse so to detect that we're gonna say if input dot get mouse button down zero so this will this will be true whenever we click our mouse on the screen since so this zero means the zero button of our mouse or the left button of our mouse okay so whenever we left click on the screen we simply want to get our target position to same as the mouse position so here we're going to say target pose equals mouse pose okay so now our target position is same as our mouse position so now all we need to do is move our player towards this target position okay to do that inside this click to move function we're going to use a function called vector to dot move towards so this function slowly moves a value from one value to another value okay so for first value we're gonna give our current position which is transform dot position and then we're gonna give our target position where we actually want to move 
so here we're gonna write target pose okay and then we need to write by how much rate we want to but how much rate or by how much speed we want to move from our current position to the target position for that we're gonna give our move speed value all right so this way this function will slowly move from this value to this value by this amount of speed and finally every frame every frame after getting the value we need to store it into our actual position so that our player's position actually changes every frame so here we need to write transform dot position equals this one okay so this way we are slowly moving our current position value to the target position value with this amount and then we are storing the updated value into our current position okay so now that we have written this code now all we need to do is instead of writing this code again and again we need to call this click move function from our fixed update function okay so here we're gonna simply write click to move so this way we call a function so we are calling this function from here so that this function will be called every frame or every fixed update frame and our whenever we click our mouse our target position will be generated and this way this will happen now one thing we need to do is from the last tutorial we need to actually comment this code out otherwise our player will always be positioned towards our mouse that's what we don't want in this case so now let's save this go back to unity and now we will see whenever I click our mouse automatically our player moves towards that position so it doesn't matter wherever I click our mouse automatically the player's position gets updated and goes to that position so our code is working okay so now we're gonna do simple 2d platformer movement or 2d left and right movement on a platformer using physics controls okay so let's get started so here we have two new sprites so first of all I'm gonna use this ground sprite and it must be a tiled or symmetric image now I'm gonna rename it to ground you can skip this step as well now from the draw mode I'm gonna choose tiled and then I'm gonna use this rect selection tool and then I'm gonna drag it to make it bigger something like this all right now I'm gonna move it to the bottom then we're gonna add a physics 2d collider so here I'm gonna go to add component physics 2d and we're gonna add a box collider 2d and as you can see here we have a collider I'm gonna click on this edit collider button and drag it to make it bigger or you can simply go ahead and change the size of the X directly okay so now that we have the collider it can detect collisions and our player will not go through it now we're gonna select our player we're gonna rename this one to player then we're gonna go to add component physics 2d and we're gonna add a first of all we're gonna add a rigid body 2d because this is what we need to use for physics inputs or physics systems or any kind of physics control then we're gonna go to add component physics 2d and this time we're gonna add a box collider 2 to it so box collider 2d then we are gonna use this edit collider button and make it smaller something like this now we can click on play and you will see the player will drop and it will simply stop right here okay so now that we have this ready let's go ahead and write our player input controls so let's open up our scripts folder and drag and drop our player script onto this and then I'm gonna double click to open our player script okay so here we're gonna create a new function void platformer control or platformer move okay so inside this platformer move we need to use something called a rigid body to move our player so get to get the rigid body here we're gonna create a new variable rigid body 2d rb and then inside the void await function we're gonna say rb equals get component rigid body 2d okay so now we have got access to the rigid body 2d that is attached to our player using this rb variable so here we need to say rb dot velocity equals vector 2 dot right that means we are going to add a velocity to that right direction and by how much speed we want to say move speed okay and then we want to multiply it with x input all right so as you can see here we are already getting the x input and we're going to multiply it with our move speed and move it towards the right direction so this right will work as left as well when our x input will become negative that means whenever we press the left arrow key actually our x input will become negative and that way this value will become negative as well and it will move our player to the left direction 
okay so now that we have done it let's go ahead and save this go back to unity and before that we need to call this function so here we're gonna call our platformer move function right here so that it gets called and we're gonna comment out our click to move function okay so now let's go back to unity here we have our player controller here we have our move speed let's give a value of 15 and let's click on play and as you can see this is giving us the wrong results and that's because we are adding the velocity in every frame but that's not what you're gonna do so let's go ahead and open up our script again so here as you can see we are adding the velocity directly so instead of that what we need to do is we need to say new vector 2 and for the x value we're gonna give this value and for the y value we're gonna simply say rb dot velocity dot y okay so this way what we are doing is we are keeping the y velocity same but we are modifying the x velocity okay now here we need to simply remove this vector to dot right because we don't need that anymore because we are already adding the speed in the x axis and for the y axis we are keeping its same value okay so y axis we are keeping the value same and for the x input or for the x axis we are giving this value so now let's save this go back to unity select our player controller and now as you can see i can move the player left and right and it is moving way too fast so in order to do that in order to control that we're gonna change the speed to let's say let's say five and now if i click on play as you can see now it's moving with a different speed you can also make it smaller like let's say 0 0.5 or 2 i think 2 should work good so as you can see now the player moves and it moves left and right 0 0.5 should work good as well so as you can see now it moves left and right with this speed and it pretty much works so our player controller with this physics input is working okay so now we're gonna learn how we can flip our player to left and right so if you click on play so here as you can see even when we are moving to the left the player is not looking towards the left it's still looking towards the right now an easy way to use the an easy way to flip the player is to use the flip x and y functionalities from sprite renderer as you can see here we have the player character and from the sprite renderer if we click on this flip x as you can see it gets flipped and if i uncheck it it gets uh, unflipped as well so this is what we're going to use in our code to flip our player so let's open our player controller script and here we're going to create a new function we're going to call it void flip player okay so now inside this function we need to actually flip our player so first of all we need to get access to the sprite renderer component for that we're going to create a new variable sprite renderer and we're going to name this one sp and inside our awake function we're going to say sp equals get component sprite renderer okay so now this way we have got access to the sprite renderer component inside our sp variable now inside the flip player function we need to check if rb.velocity.x is less than 0.1 f that means if our x velocity is less than negative 0.1 that means we are moving to the left only then we need to flip our player so for that we're going to say sp.flipx equals true and when this is not happening else if rb.velocity.x is greater than 0.1f that means if it is moving towards the right direction then we're going to say sp.flipx equals false okay so whenever it's moving towards the left we'll make the flip x true whenever it is moving towards the right we're going to make the flip x false now we need to call this function every frame so inside the fixed update here we're going to call the flip player function so that it checks for the flipping player checks for flipping the player every frame now we can save it go back to unity and now as you can see every time i press the left button and when the player moves left it automatically flips to the left direction and whenever i move to the right it automatically rotates to the right direction and gets flipped to the right direction so this way our player is moving and it is also getting flipped 
So thank you so much for watching this video about 2D game development and C Sharp scripting in Unity. I hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot of new things in this video. So thank you so much. If you want to learn more and build some more cool stuff, you can check out all my different courses from the links given in the description of this video. So thank you so much for watching. This is Raja from Charger Games. Keep learning and I'm gonna see you in the next videos. Hi everyone, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to another Unity C Sharp 2D video. So in this video, we're going to learn how to make your player jump very easily with some simple lines of codes using C Sharp. So let's get started. So currently what we have in the scene is we have a player and currently it can simply run on this platform. It can go left and right and it can simply go this is all it can do it cannot jump it cannot do double jump or anything like that okay and we have already learned how to do this in my first unity c sharp scripting 2d tutorial so if you haven't checked that video make sure to check that out and you will learn all these things but i'm gonna go ahead and explain it to you uh, a little little bit here so here's the script that we are using so here we have two functions the platform move function which is responsible for the movement and the flip player function which is responsible for the flipping of the player to left and right direction okay so using this function we are simply adding the velocity in the x axis and in the y axis we are keeping the velocity same and then we are calling this platform move function from our fixed update and we are taking the inputs from our input.get axis. So we are taking the inputs, getting the inputs and moving the player using this transform.translate function. All right. Okay. So this is what we're using to move the player. All right. So now we're going to learn how we can add some jump feature to our player. So for that, here I'm going to create a new function called void jump. And inside this, we're going to add the functionality to jump. Now, adding the jump functionality is very, very easy. So, in order to add the jump, here we're simply going to say RB, which is the rigid body that is attached to the player. So, make sure you have a rigid body attached to the player and make sure you have access to the rigid body by using this rigid body 2D RB variable. All right. Now, here we're going to say RB.velocity. So we are going to set the velocity of our rigid body and we're going to set the velocity to vector 2 dot up multiplied by jump force. So we have not created this variable yet, but we will create soon. So here what you're doing is we are adding a jump force at the upwards direction to our character. Okay. So now here we're going to create a new float variable. We're going to call it jump force public float jump force so this will decide by how much force we want to make our player jump okay so now this function is responsible for making our player jump now let's go back to our update function and here we're going to say if input dot get key down key code dot space so that pretty much means whenever we press the space key on our keyboard we want our player to jump so when the space key is pressed we simply want to call the jump function right here so that means whenever the space button is pressed our player will jump so let's go back to unity and check how this is working so we need to add a jump force manually here as you can see the jump force is set to zero so i'm going to add the jump force let's say about five or something i think something like five should be okay so let's add five click on play and now you will see here we have the player we can move left and right and when I press the space button our player jumps and it looks like it's floating in the air so you can go ahead and increment the value of jump speed let's say make it about 10 and you will see the player jumps higher but it still looks like the player is floating on the sky now in order to make the jump behavior a little bit better what you can do is you can increase the gravity scale of the player's rigid body so that the player falls down faster so as you can see here we have the rigid body attached to the player and the gravity scale is set to 1 so we're going to go ahead and make it 5 you can also make it 3 so you need to simply go ahead and um, try different combinations of this gravity scale and this jump force to create a behavior that actually works for your game 
So I'm going to give the gravity scale to 5 and I'm going to set the jump force to about let's say 15. And now if I click on play, you will see now we will get a much better behavior like it looks like now it's really jumping. You can also go ahead and make the jump speed a little bit higher so that uh, the player jumps even more but I think this one is good for me and it is giving me a good jumping behavior. So now the jump is working but the problem is that our player can jump infinite amount of time so as you can see if I press the space button any number of times our player can keep jumping and it can go to the sky and never come back. Okay so we need to fix this issue if we want to actually create a realistic jump movement. Now in order to do the jumping or in order to prevent from multiple jumping what we want to do is we want to do something called ground check. So we're going to check if our character is actually in the ground and if it is on the ground only then we will allow it to jump and if it is not in the ground we're gonna, we are not going to allow it to jump. Okay. Now in order to check whether our player is on the ground or not we're going to create a simple empty game object which you're going to call ground check which will check if our player is at the ground or not. So currently as you can see I have already created a ground check variable here. So I'm going to delete this one. You can simply select your player character, right click, create an empty game object and make sure it is the child of your player character. Now I'm going to rename this one to ground check. Now you can go here and click and select an icon so that you can see it clearly on the scene. I think I'm going to select this icon. And now you can simply drag the ground check down somewhere like this in the middle of the two feet. So this is the point which will check whether our player is at the ground or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a small circle right here. And that circle will check if it is colliding with the ground. And if the circle is colliding with the ground, that means we are on the ground and we can jump. And if the circle is not colliding with the ground, that means we are currently jumping and we cannot jump anymore. Alright. So now, let's go back to our player script. Where is that? Here's our player script. Let's go back to it. Now we need to do something that is ground check. So for that, here we're going to create a new variable. We're going to call it bool is grounded. Okay. So what this will do is, this variable will store whether our player is currently grounded or not. So this boolean variable can store only two values, either true or false. Okay. So when it is grounded, it will be true. When it is not grounded, it will be false. And depending on that, we're going to take the decision of jumping or not jumping. Alright, so now inside the fixed update, we're going to write is grounded equal to, that means we are we are assigning a value to is grounded and what value we are going to assign? Here we're going to say physics 2D dot overlap sphere, not overlap sphere, overlap circle because this is a 2D game. So we are creating a small little circle at the position so that we can check if the circle is colliding with the ground and depending on that we're going to say is grounded is true or false okay so first of all we have to pass the position where we want to create the small little circle so here we have already created a variable uh, we have not created yet but we have created a we have created an empty game object in the scene which is our ground check element and that is the object's position we're going to set here. So first of all, let us create a new game object or new uh, variable here. Public transform ground check. Okay. And here we're going to simply say ground check dot position. Okay. And for the second variable, we need to pass how much radius of the circle that we want. So let's say I want a circle with a radius of 0. 2f. So I'm going to pass that. And as a third parameter, we need to actually say, we need to pass a layer mask. So that means which layers we want to check as ground. So let's say in our case, in our game, we have different layers like water, air, ground. So we're going to specify 
which layer is actually ground and we're gonna check our is grounded variable only at that layer okay so for that here we need to create another new variable public layer mask ground layer all right and here we're gonna simply pass ground layer so this is the only layer that we want to check and we can of course set it up from our inspector okay so now the is grounded variable will be true or false depending on whether our circle is overlapping with the ground or not so now whenever the space button is pressed first of all we're gonna check if is grounded that means if our character is grounded only then we're gonna jump okay so when our character is grounded only then we're gonna jump otherwise we are not going to allow it to jump so this should work let's go back to unity because we have to assign some more values now so here we are inside unity and uh, let's wait for it to load and if you select our player character as you can see here we have a slot for ground check so here we need to pass the position which we want to check our ground so here we have the ground check element we're gonna drag and drop our ground check element right over here and for the second one we have to decide the ground layer currently it is set to nothing so for that we're gonna select our ground as you can see currently we have only this one set as our, set as our ground and we're gonna go to the layers click on add layer create a new layer called ground select our ground again go to layer and select ground so now our ground is positioned at the ground layer so from the player character we're gonna go to the ground layer and say only check the ground layer nothing else so now everything should work because we have set up all the variables and we have also written the code so let's click on play to see how this is working and here's our player I can try to jump multiple times and as you can see currently I can jump only once if I jump and try to jump again I cannot I it doesn't matter how many times I press the space button it doesn't matter it doesn't jump anymore and that's because it is checking for the ground and only when the player is grounded we are allowing it to jump that's why it's not jumping anymore okay so our code is working completely fine so if you're having problem let me try to explain it to you one more time so first of all we are creating a small little circle at the position of the ground check with this radius and we are telling this circle to check if it is colliding with any other object or if it is overlapping with any other object in the ground layer so if it is overlapping with any other object in the ground layer then it will turn true that means our is grounded will be true and when it is not colliding with anything our is grounded will automatically be false and inside our update we are saying when we press the space button if our player is grounded only then allow it to jump and if it is not grounded then don't allow it to jump okay as simple as that so this way our player can jump only when it is grounded and we have found out some ways by which you can actually detect the ground check so I hope this video helps you it might be a little bit confusing but try to rewatch this again and it will become clear to you so thank you so much for watching this is Raja and I try to make it simple so if it, if, it becomes, if it becomes complex sorry for that so if you like this video please hit the like button so that I can make more videos like this and make sure to subscribe to my channel if you are new to this so thank you so much for watching and I'm gonna see you in a new video soon hi everyone this is Raja and welcome back to another video in this C sharp scripting for 2d game development series so in this video we're going to learn how to implement a double jump in your game if you're creating a 2d character controller or anything so currently we have already implemented the jump feature and the movement feature so if you have not checked the previous videos you can check that and implement the jump feature or if you already have the jump feature implemented from some other videos or some other ways you can use that as well 
So let me show you what our character does currently. So if I click on play, you can see that our character can move left and right and it can also jump but it can jump only once it cannot jump multiple times because we have added some ground checking features so that it can jump only once when it is grounded so now let's open our player jump script and as you can see here all we are doing is whenever our space key is pressed we are checking if our player is grounded then we are making our player jump and we have the jump code inside this jump function and for the is grounded we are checking it here using this overlap circle feature so if you don't know how these things work if you if you want to know about this in more detail make sure you check out my video on jumping and my video on 2d game development so that you can know more about it so now that we have this jump we want to make our player uh, double jump so we want our player to jump two times not more than that okay so once once it's jump after that we want it to jump one more time so let's see how we can do that so for that first of all here we're gonna create a new boolean variable so we're gonna call it bool can double jump if you want you can simply go ahead and rename it to any other thing that you like so this thing will actually control if our player can jump again or not all right so as you can see in this case First of all, we are checking if our player is grounded, then we are making it jump. But our can double jump variable is false by default from before. Okay, so we want our player to jump again only when this can double jump feature becomes true. Okay, so as you can see here, we are saying if is grounded, then jump. Then below that, we're going to say else if can double jump then we're gonna make it jump once again okay so if our player is grounded then we're gonna make it jump and if it is not grounded but we have this can double jump feature to true then we're gonna make it jump once again now here we need to do few more things as you can see can double jump is false by default so we need to found out a way so that we can make it true at some point of time so that this one becomes true and our player can jump again so we're gonna do that inside this thing so whenever our player jumps for the very first time we're gonna say can double jump equals true all right so whenever our player jumps for the very first time we're gonna make can double jump to true so that whenever our player presses this space button one more time it will come to this if statement and it will check can double jump is true and then it will jump again okay now after it has jumped now we need to make this can double jump to false again because if we don't make it false then it will keep jumping again and again and again so we need to make it true here then jump and then make it false right here so can double jump equals false okay so with this simple lines of code it should work and the double jump feature should work now you can implement the jump in any way it doesn't matter how you have implemented the jump but you just need to call the jump function here then make the can double jump true and then check if can double jump is true then jump once again and after that make the can double jump false so now that we have written it let's save this and check how it is working in our unity project so as you can see here we are inside unity and here i'm gonna go ahead and click on play to actually check how the player can double jump so as you can see it can move left and right it can move oops it has probably fallen down so let's check one more time it can move left and right it can jump and once again jump it can jump and once again jump and as you can see currently it can jump only twice and not more than that so now our player can double jump and move to higher positions but not more than that okay so if you want you can also add triple jump or quadruple jumps or anything that you want but this is the simplest way to add double jumps now you can add many more variables here and do many more things as an example let's say for the first time you want to make the player jump a certain amount but when it jumps for the second time you want it to jump a lesser amount okay 
so you can of course do that you can do many more things but this is the basic functionality of double jumping and this is how you can implement it very very easily using this simple lines of code so now let's see how we can add a little more behavior to this so how we can make this more interesting so now we're gonna add a functionality so that when it jumps for the first time it jumps for this amount this 20 jump force and when it jumps for the second time it jumps a lot less than that so that our double jump will be less powerful than our first jump so as you can see if I run it currently you will see that our player jumps both times with the same velocity but what you're gonna do is for the first time it should jump this and for the second time it should not jump that much higher so let's see how we can do that so let's open up our code and now as you can see our jump is actually getting controlled by this jump force amount or this jump force variable so this variable is controlling how much we can jump in the air so here what we're gonna do is when we are making our player double jump before that we're gonna simply reduce the value of our jump force so here we're gonna say jump force equals jump force by 2 alright so when the player actually double jumps we are making the jump force half okay so that means we are making the second jump less powerful than the first jump now that we have made it half we have to reset it again because if we don't do it then next time when we start jumping from the beginning our jump force will be half of the original jump force that we have set so after finishing the double jump we have to reset the value of this variable again so here we're gonna say jump force equals jump force multiplied by 2 okay so here we are first of all making the jump force half when we are double jumping and after finishing the jump we are making it same as it was before by multiplying 2 again all right so now let's go back to unity and check how this one is working so now this one will give you a more realistic behavior so if i click on play as you can see the jump force is set to 20 i can set it to let's say 15 and click on play and now you will see for the first time it jumps higher and the second time it jumps much lower than how it jumps for the first time let's make it 20 for better understanding so let's make it 20 and click on play as you can see for the first time it jumps this and the second time it jumps this so it jumps much lesser when it jumps for the second time because we have made the jump force value half of what it was before now as you can see the second jump is much much lower than the first so it is not much realistic like what we want so to make it even better what you're gonna do is instead of dividing it by 2 we're gonna divide it by 1.5 f that means we are not making it half of it but 1.5 part of it and here we need to multiply it with 1.5 again so we are not making it so less but we are making it a little bit less than the original jump force that it had before so now it should give us a much better behavior for the double jump so let's go back to unity and check how this one has improved our jumping so now if I click on play you will see here we have our character and now I can simply jump and jump and as you can see second jump is a little more powerful than how it was doing when we made it actually half let me click on maximize on play so that you can see it clearly so as you can see here's our character and when it jumps for the second time it jumps a lot lesser but it is giving us a lot more realistic behavior all right oops <laughs> to solve this issue as you can see it fell down to solve this issue you can simply go to your player corrector go to the rigid body go to the constraints and set the freeze rotation on z and now it will never fall down so if i click on play you will see now it jumps twice and gives a much better behavior than we had before and it looks really really awesome all right so this is how our double jump feature is actually working and we have also learned how we can add few more layers of complexity and make it make the behavior even more interesting by multiplying and adding and dividing it by your value so i hope you really enjoyed this video and learned a lot of new things and i'm gonna uh, i hope you will use this feature in some of your games 
So thank you so much for watching this video. If this video helped you, make sure to hit the like button. And if you want more like this videos, make sure to subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this. So thank you so much for watching. This is Raja and I'm going to see you with a new video soon. Till then, stay happy and keep learning. Hey everyone, welcome back to Charger Games. My name is Raja and in this video we're going to learn about essential c -sharp scripting concepts with Unity by a lot of different examples. So if you want to learn about the basics of c -sharp and absolute basics of c -sharp, then you can check out my other videos or other courses where I talk about that in details. But this one is going to be practical, full of examples and projects. So all the links to my different videos and courses are in the description of this video. So you can go ahead and check them out. So with that being said, let's get started. So first of all, I have a sprite here this tank sprite which I'm gonna use to demonstrate different things you can use any other image that you want so I'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop it in our hierarchy and I'm gonna go to our main camera select the background and change its color to something like this so that it looks pretty good and not the default color which I don't really like so I think I'm gonna keep it something like this then I'm going to go ahead and change the size of our main camera a little bit so that our tank becomes bigger. So I think I'm going to make it something like this. Let's make it 3. Alright. So now we're going to create our very first script and attach it to our tank. So I'm going to go to assets folder, create a new folder named scripts. And inside the scripts folder, right click create a new C sharp script and I'm going to name it, let's say examples. And also you need to remember that I have created a 2D project here. So if you have not created a 2D project, then you will not be able to import these sprites like this. Now I'm going to go ahead and select my tank and drag and drop this C sharp script on this tank. Now I'm going to double click to open the C sharp script. So now as you can see our script has opened. I'm going to make the font size a little bit bigger. So as you can see here we have the start and update function. The start function gets called at the beginning of the game and the update function gets called every frame. So every frame our game runs this update function gets called. So now for the first thing that we're going to learn is uh, let's go ahead and learn something simple. So first we're going to learn how to destroy a game object. So to destroy any game object, we need to simply write destroy, which is a function. So we need to give a pair of parentheses and inside that we need to write game object and then a semicolon. So that pretty much means we are going to destroy the game object and which game object we want to destroy. We want to destroy the game object with which this script is attached. So let me go ahead and save it. And if you go back to Unity, you will see that our script is attached to this tank. So that pretty much means we want to destroy the tank as soon as the game starts. So let's see and go ahead and click on play. And you will see that as soon as the game starts, the tank gets destroyed because we have told it to do so. So that's how we destroy the tank. So now let's see another example of how we can do something more with this. So let's say we don't want to destroy it immediately, but we want to destroy it after three seconds or five seconds. To do that, after writing game object, we have to give a comma and then we need to write the number of seconds after which we want to destroy the game object. So in this case, let's say I want to destroy it after three seconds. So I'm going to write 3f. So now after starting the game, the object will be destroyed after 3 seconds. So make sure to save it. Go back to Unity. Now let's click on play and count 1, 2, 3. Boom. And as you can see, after 3 seconds, the tag got destroyed. I actually counted 3 very fast. So uh, pardon me for that. So that's how you destroy objects in different ways.
So now let's go ahead and learn how we can destroy the same object by clicking on that object. Okay. So now we're going to learn about mouse clicks and how we can detect mouse clicks. So in order to detect mouse clicks on any object, we need to use this function void on mouse down. So this void on mouse down function gets called automatically whenever we click on any object. All right. So whenever this object gets called, that means whenever we click on an object, then we want to destroy that object. All right. So now we're going to copy this code and paste it here. And instead of 3F, I'm just going to simply write destroy game object because we want to destroy the object immediately, not after three seconds. All right. And now we don't want to destroy the game object at the start. So I'm going to write double slash here. So that means we are writing it as a comment. That means it will not affect our code. It will stay here, but it will not be affecting our code by any way. So now whenever we click our mouse on the object, we want to destroy the object. So now let's go ahead and click on play and see if it is working at all or not. So if I click on play, as you can see, when I click on it, nothing happens. And that's because we are clicking on the object, but our mouse doesn't know if we are clicking on it or not. So in order to detect clicks or collisions, we need to add a collider to our game object. All right. So let's go ahead and select our tank, then go to add component and then go to physics 2D. And from here, we're going to use this box collider 2D. So if you double click on the tank and zoom in it, as you can see here, we have a green outline and you can use this edit collider option to edit this green outline. So this green outline is now the collider of this tank. So this is the area in which we can collide and interact and click on the tank. All right. So now if I go ahead and click on play, now you can go ahead and click on it. And as you can see, as soon as I click on it, the tank gets destroyed. Let me see it one more time. Three, two, one, boom. And as you can see, as soon as I click on it, the tank gets destroyed. So this is how we can destroy the tank by using mouse clicks. So this is how we take mouse inputs very easily. So now let's go ahead and learn how we can do the same thing. But instead of mouse, this time we're going to do inputs from our keyboard. So let's learn how we can take inputs from the keyboard and then destroy the object. So in order to destroy the object using keyboard inputs, we're going to come to our update function. And here we're going to write if input dot get key down. That means if we are pressing any of our keys and then inside this, we need to write which key we want to detect. Let's say in this case, we want to say whenever we press the space button on our keyboard, we simply want to destroy our game object. So here we need to write key code dot space and all these are predefined. So you have to write exactly as they have been set in unity. So you cannot simply make the is small or write some other spelling. So it's a good idea to use the auto completion in these cases to write the perfect thing that unity requires you to write. All right. So here what we are doing is First of all, we are getting input dot get key down key code dot space. And this thing returns true whenever we press the space button on our keyboard. So this if statement checks if we are pressing the space button on our keyboard. And if we press the space button on our keyboard, then what we want to do? We want to destroy the game object. All right. So here again, I'm going to write destroy game object. So this way, whenever we're going to press the space button on our keyboard, we want to destroy the game object. All right. So now let's go back to unity and of course, save the script every time you make some changes. So go back to unity, click on play. And now I'm going to press the space button 
And as you can see, as soon as I press the space button, the tank gets destroyed. So let me try it one more time. So three, two, one, space. And as you can see, as soon as I press the space button, it gets destroyed. So this is how we can take the basic keyboard input in Unity. All right, so now that we have learned how to take keyboard and mouse inputs, it's time to move our tank. So let's see how we can move our game objects in Unity very, very easily. Now, in order to move our game objects, there are various different ways. We can either change its position directly by using some code, or we can use the transform.translate function to translate it to a certain position, or we can use the Unity's built-in physics objects or physics properties and physics functions to move the object. So in this case, we're going to try to use the physics functions to move the object. And if we want any of the physics functions to be used on any game object in Unity, we need to add something called the rigid body 2D on that object. All right. So here we need to add the rigid body 2D to this tank as well. So here I'm going to come to add component, go to physics 2D and add the rigid body 2D. Here it is. So now that we have added the rigid body 2D, we also need to set the gravity scale to zero because if we set to one, then the gravity will affect the tank and it will fall down. As you can see, it falls down. So we're gonna set the gravity to zero, all right? So now that the gravity is zero and we have the rigid body attached to the tank, now we need to move the tank. So let's go ahead and open our script. And as you can see, so first of all, what we need to do is we need to get access to the rigid body that is attached to our tank. All right. So first of all, here we're going to create a reference. So we're going to write rigid body 2D RB. So this RB will store a reference to the rigid body 2D that is attached to our game object. So in the start function, we're going to say RB equals get component rigid body 2D. So now what it does is this gives us access to the rigid body 2D that is attached to this game object and stores the reference inside this RB variable. So now everything that we want to do with the rigid body, we can do it using the RB. All right. But it is a good idea and it is a good practice to do this referencing things or getting access things, all this in the awake function instead of start function. So here we're going to write void awake and inside the awake function, I'm going to go ahead and move this thing. So whenever you are getting a reference to some objects or components or whenever you are getting access to any components, it's a good idea to use it inside the awake function because awake gets called before start and before starting the game. So this is how we get access to the rigid body. Now we need to do something with this rigid body. So what we can do is to move the tank or move the player or game object, we can change its velocity. All right. So to change its velocity, we can go to start and here we write RB dot velocity equals vector two dot right multiply five F. So now what we'll do is let's see what it will do. So let me go ahead and click on play. And as you can see, the tank will move to the right with this speed. All right. So here, what we're doing is we are giving the tank a velocity in the right direction and we are multiplying it with 5f. That means we are giving it a velocity of 5 in the right direction. Now it's a good idea to always not hard code these values like this and store it as a variable so that we can set it and change it anytime. Let's say we want to increase the velocity. So we don't have to change this every time. We have to simply change the value of the variable and this will work fine. So what we can do is here we can create a public variable. So you can write public float speed. So the speed variable will determine 
how much fast or slow our object will move all right so here instead of writing 5f we're going to simply write speed so now the speed value will be multiplied with vector to the right that means we are adding the velocity in the right direction and then setting that velocity to our rigid body all right so now let's go back to unity and select our tank and as you can see if you select the script let me move the script to bottom so let me move it to bottom like this all right so as you can see here we have the speed value set to zero that means now if i go ahead and run it our tank will not move at all so what we can do is we can give it a speed value let's say two and now if i run it you will see our tank will slowly move by two in the right side we can give it a speed value of let's say 10 and now it will move faster and then let's say we give it a speed value of minus 10 or let's say for now minus 2 and if I run it you will see that it is going to move in the opposite direction because we are multiplying the velocity with negative 2 so we are multiplying the velocity with negative 2 that means it is moving in the opposite direction another thing you can do is instead of multiplying it with negative 2 we can keep it 2 here and in the code instead of writing vector 2 dot right we can simply write vector 2 dot left so now instead of applying the speed on the right side this will apply the speed on the left side so let's go and check if it works so if I click on play you will see now it moves on the left side so here what we are doing is in the start function in the starting of the game we are giving a velocity to our game object so we are giving a fixed velocity to our game object at the starting of our game so our game object keeps moving with the velocity as long as the game runs so this is how we can easily add movement or velocity to our game object using the physics functions okay so now that we have learned how to add velocity to our game object now let's learn how we can move our game object left and right using keyboard inputs so now as you can see here we have learned a way to take keyboard input by using this input dot get key down but there are other efficient ways to take inputs when we are taking continuous input from the keyboard so let's say I want to move the tank to the left as long as I keep pressing the left arrow key the same way I want to make the tank move to the right as long as I press the right arrow key now in order to use these things in order to check whether I am pressing for continuous amounts of time unity has created a feature for us and it has set something called an axis so using this axis we can use some built-in keyboard functionalities and use them in our game all right so if I go to here in the unity and go to edit project settings and then I go to input as you can see here we have something called axis and if I just expand it as you can see here we have something called horizontal and for the horizontal axis the negative button is already set to the left arrow key and the positive button is already set to the right arrow key all right so when we are going to use this axis and whenever we are pressing the left arrow key automatically it will set it as its negative button and set the right arrow key as its positive button so whenever we use this input dot get axis horizontal function it will return us a value between 0 and negative 1 or 0 and positive 1 so when we are pressing the left arrow key it will return us a value about 0 to negative 1 and when we are pressing the right arrow key it will return us a value of 0 to positive 1 so using this negative 1 and the positive 1 value we can determine whether we are pressing the left or right arrow key and we can move our tank accordingly now it will become clear as you see it 
as I code and you do it yourself as well. So inside the Visual Studio, now what we will do is, here inside the update function, okay, first of all, here we'll create a separate variable. So here we'll write float x input. So this input will take the value of the left or right arrow keys from our input.getAxis function. So inside the update function, we can write x input equals input dot get axis and inside that we write horizontal. Why? Because just a few seconds ago we have seen that Unity has already set up an axis called horizontal for us for which the negative button is left arrow key and the positive button is right arrow key. So just by writing horizontal we can automatically get inputs from the left and right arrow keys. So when we are pressing the left arrow key, the x input will have a value of negative 1. And whenever we are pressing the right arrow key, this x input will have a value of positive 1. And when we are not pressing anything, this x input will automatically return to 0. So this way we can easily take inputs from our keyboard. Now we need to use this keyboard input and move our game object or add velocity to our game object accordingly. Now in order to do that, as you can see here we are adding the velocity using the physics functions in Unity. So whenever we are using the physics functions, it's always a good idea to use the fixed update function instead of update or start. So for the physics functionalities, we should always use the fixed update function. So here we're going to write void fixed update. So this is the fixed update function. Now inside the fixed update function, as you can see here, we have this arbiter velocity. I'm just going to go ahead and copy it and paste it right here. And I'm going to comment this one out. So this is not going to use it, use it at all. So inside the fixed update, this fixed update is getting called every physics frame. So this function will get called continuously as well, just like update. But update gets called every frame but fixed update gets called every physics frame. So whenever you are creating some physics behaviors for your game, it's always a good idea to put it inside the fixed update so that you get reliable and good results. So inside this, we are saying r.velocity equals vector2.left multiply by speed. So instead of that, what you're going to do is we're going to say vector2.write and then we're going to multiply it with x input and then we're going to multiply it with our speed. Alright? So here what you're doing is vector to right simply means in the right direction and x input gives us a value of either negative 1, positive 1 or 0. So whenever we are pressing the right arrow key, this will automatically become 1. So it will automatically move to the right side by this speed. And when we are pressing the left arrow key, this x input will become negative 1. So that means this together will be a negative value, negative 1. And then we're going to multiply it with our speed. Alright? So then it will move to the left side. And when we are not pressing anything, the x input value will be 0. That means this whole value will be zero. That means the velocity of our object will be zero as well. So this way, by using this simple input control, we can move our object left and right. So now let's go back to Unity and select our tank. I'm going to change the speed to, well, let's keep it two for now. And I'm going to click on play to see if it is working or not and I'm going to press the left arrow key and then I'm going to press the right arrow key and as you can see nothing is working and and here nothing is working because you can click here to see the error and as you can see it says input axis horizontal is not set up and that's because I have made a typing mistake so you have to write it exactly as it is written in Unity's axis otherwise it's not going to work so it's always a good idea to go to edit, project settings, input, 
and for the horizontal you can just copy the name from here and write it exactly as it is written here so I have pasted it from there to here so now it is written exactly as it is in the unity settings so now I can close it and close this one as well click on play and now as you can see if I press the left and right arrow keys on my keyboard I can move the tank left and right by this two speed I can also change the speed to let's say 5 and then again I can move it with faster speed to left and right direction so this is how we can move a game object left and right using the arrow keys on our keyboard very very easily now another thing you'll see that here the value is 5 but as soon as I stop playing the game the value will return to 2 so whenever you are changing the values while playing the game they will not stay so you have to remember that you make all the changes while you are not playing the game so here I'm gonna give the value 5 and it should be fine so this way we have learned how to make the tank move left and right all right so now let's go ahead and add a terrain so that I can so that our tank can walk on it or move on it so I'm gonna go to this sprites folder and I'm gonna drag and drop this grass meat sprite that I have in the scene and I'm gonna move it down below like this I think I'm gonna move it to somewhere like this now I'm gonna select this grass mid uh, not this one this one the grass mid change its draw mode to tiled and now I'm gonna select this rect tool and then I'm gonna go to this grass mid in the scene view now what I can do is I can simply drag it and as you can see it will move because we have changed it to tile settings so all the objects will be tiled together like this now we can drag this grass center at here I can move it at the bottom of this and we can match it exactly as it is by using this rect tool so we can drag it and move it to match it with this one something like this then we can go ahead and change it to tiled as well so I'm gonna go to this cross center change its draw mode to tiled and then I can drag it like this and drag it like this on this way as well so now we have this thing now we can press shift and select both of these things together by pressing the shift key on my keyboard then use the move tool and move it a little bit down so that they look realistic something like this now I have to give a collider to my grass mid which is on the top so that our tank can collide with it otherwise what will happen is whenever we will put our tank here it will go through it because our ground has no collider so it cannot collide with the tank so I'm gonna select the grass mid go to add component physics 2d box collider 2d and as you can see here we have this green thing that is our box collider now I'm gonna click on this edit collider button and by selecting this point I'm gonna drag it to this side and selecting this point I'm gonna drag it to this side so now our ground has a collider which is pretty much big now what I can do I can select our tank go to the rigid body and give the gravity scale back to 1 and now if I click on play you will see our tank will fall down due to gravity and it will land on this one alright so as you can see now our tank lands on this one and it is it is going down very slowly because in every physics frame we are changing its velocity by our code not this one so if you see here as you can see in our code every physics frame or every in every fixed update we are changing its velocity so that is why its gravity has become very very slow all right so now we can move the tank to a place something like this and if we want we can simply remove the gravity because we don't need it we are not going to make the tank do something like that so let's go ahead and change the gravity scale to back to zero again so now our tank is here 
and we can already move our tank left and right by using arrow keys so let's go ahead and test if it is working still or not so you can press the left and right arrow keys and move the tank left and right and now it looks like it is moving on the ground so now let's try to do something else let's try to rotate our tank to the left side whenever it moves to the left and rotate our tank to the right side whenever it moves to the right now a very easy way to do this is by flipping the sprite of our tank so as you can see here we have this tank and here we have something called a sprite renderer attached to our tank and here we have something called flip so if I click on this flip X as you can see the sprite will rotate and flip to the X direction and if I uncheck it it will rotate again so if we can access this flip component from our script then we can simply rotate the tank to the left or right direction all right so let's see how we can do that so here we are back inside the unity uh, the visual studio so here we're going to create a reference to the sprite renderer that we have in our scene for our player or for our tank so here we're going to write sprite renderer sprite all right so now inside this sprite we'll store the reference of the sprite renderer component now there's another way to do that we can simply write public here and as you can see before while accessing the rigid body 2d in the awake function we have used this git component function and using this function we have got access to the rigid body 2d now we can do similar thing with our sprite as well so we can simply write sprite equals git component sprite renderer but here let's learn another way to do it so here as you can see I have made this sprite renderer public now if I go ahead and select the tank here you will see here we have a field called sprite which is waiting for a sprite renderer so in this sprite renderer we can either drag this sprite right here so from here as you can see I can simply drag the sprite renderer and drop it here or I can simply use the tank and drag and drop it here as well so it automatically converts it into a sprite renderer reference so this way when we drag and drop this one to here we don't need to manually do it from our code by writing this get component function so in this case I just uh, showed you this so that you can learn both of these things and use them according to your own wish or whenever you need whichever functionality so now that we have access to this sprite renderer inside this sprite variable inside the update function we will check when our player moves to the left or when the value of our x input is less than zero that means whenever our player is moving to the left or whenever we are pressing the left arrow key in that case we want to flip it or flip the x direction I mean flip the x direction of the sprite and whenever we are pressing the right arrow key we want to uncheck the flip x property or we want to make the flip x false so let me show you to you here as you can see here we have the tank and here we have the flip so when we are moving to the left we simply want to check this flip x that means we want to make the flip x true and when we are moving to the right we want to make the flip x false as you can see currently it is false all right so here we're going to say if x input is less than zero then we're going to say sprite dot flip x equals true all right then we're going to say else if x input is greater than zero then sprite dot flip x equals false so now whenever the x input value is less than zero that means we are pressing the left arrow key we're going to flip the sprite and whenever the x input is greater than zero that means we are pressing the right arrow key we're going to make the flip x false so that it returns to its default position so let's go ahead and save it 
go back to Unity and see if it is working or not. So I'm going to click on play. And now you'll see whenever I press the left arrow key, the tank automatically moves to the left. I mean rotates to the left or flip X. And as you can see here, the flip X becomes true. And whenever I move to the right, this flip X becomes false. And as you can see, the tank moves to the right. So this way I can make the tank move to the left and right direction and also change its rotation like this by flipping the sprite like this. So this, is, so this is a very useful feature that you can use in a lot of games that you create. So now let's try to do something more interesting. Now we're gonna check when our tank is colliding with another object and then we're gonna destroy that object. So let's say as you can see inside the sprites folder here we have something uh, like a box. So I can drag and drop it in the scene then move it like this. So let's say I have the box here and whenever the tank moves and collides with the box, I want to destroy the box. So that's what we are gonna code right now. Now before we can collide with the box, we have to add a collider to the box because if we don't add any collider, then our tank can simply go through. So let's see it. So if I click on play, you can see that our tank can go through the box and nothing really happens. So we don't want that. We want to go to the box and at that time we want the box to be destroyed. To do that, first of all, I'm going to select the box, go to add component, physics 2D, box collider 2D. So this way now our box has a collider attached. So now if I click on play, you will see that our tank can move and it will collide with the box. Alright, so it's not easy now or not possible now to go through the tank. So now I want to destroy the box whenever it collides with the tank. So to do that, I want to select the box, go to this tag option. And as you can see, currently it is untagged. I'm going to go to this add tag. And from here, I'm going to add a new tag. I'm going to call it enemy. Or let's say, well, let's keep it enemy for now. So if you want to add more tags, you can simply click on this plus button and add another tag here as well. Also, you can click on this negative button to remove it. Now, again, you need to go to this box, select the tag and click on enemy. So now the enemy tag is attached to our box. Now we need to write a script or from our code, we need to write something so that it will check whenever our tank collides with an object which has this enemy tag attached, then we want to destroy that object. All right. So now let's go back to our code. And in order to check for collisions, Unity has a specific function which is called on collision enter 2D. So here we're going to write void on collision enter 2D and let's auto complete it. And here we have this function. And you need to write this parameter exactly as it is written. All right. So collision 2D, you can write it collision or you can write it call. So this doesn't matter, but you need to write it as a collision 2D in the parameter. So this is the on collision enter 2D function, which gets called automatically whenever our game object collides with any other object. All right. So in this case, what we want to do is whenever our game object collides with another object, first of all, we want to check if that object has an enemy tag attached. So to do that, we're going to say if collision dot game object dot tag equals enemy. And here as well, you need to make sure that the spelling of enemy is exactly same as you have written in unity. So you can simply go to unity. And as you can see here we have the tag, we can go to add tag. And from here I can simply go ahead and I'm not sure if we can copy the enemy, but I can, I, I can go here and look at it and write it exactly as it is written here. So I can go back here. And as you can see here, we have written enemy exactly as it is written there. 
So whenever our game object collides with an object which has the enemy tag attached, then we're gonna do what we're gonna do is we're gonna simply destroy, and this is tricky. So which one we want to destroy? If we write destroy game object, then what will happen is the tank will get destroyed. So let's see if that is working. So now if I click on play, move here. And as you can see, the tank itself gets destroyed. So we don't want that. We want to destroy the box instead of the tank. To do that, instead of writing game object, here I'm going to write collision dot game object. All right. So if we write collision dot game object, that means it will destroy the game object with which the collision has happened. And if we write simply game object, so if we write destroy game object, this will mean it will destroy the game object with which the script is attached. And in this case, the script is attached to the tank. So it would have destroyed the tank itself. But we want to destroy the object with which the tank has collided. That's why we are writing collision dot game object. All right. So now save it, go back to Unity and click on play. And now you will see whenever I go ahead and as you can see the box gets destroyed immediately. So let's go ahead and create few more boxes and let's have some fun. So I'm gonna press Ctrl D on my keyboard or right click duplicate it. And as you can see here we have duplicated and I can move it right here. I can duplicate it few more times, move it here and there duplicate here and there and as you can see here we have four different boxes so now I can click on play and our tank can go here destroy this one destroy this one destroy this one and destroy this one as well so this way as you can see our tank has destroyed all the boxes in the scene whenever it collides with them so this way you can destroy the box you can also add some score so that Whenever you destroy the box, the score gets incremented and after some time when you destroy all the box, here you write you win and something like that. So this way you can progress towards a mini game and create something interesting. So let's go ahead and add some scoring mechanism to the game that will make it look even better. So let's go to our code and here on the top, I'm going to create a score variables so here we're going to write int score which is which is going to be zero in the beginning and whenever the on collision 2d happens and our tank collides with an enemy before destroying the enemy or after destroying the enemy what we can do is we can write score plus plus so score plus plus simply means we are incrementing the value of score so in the beginning the score was zero and when we will collide with the object the score will be zero plus one that is one again when we collide with the object the score will be one plus one that is two so this is how every time we collide with a game object we're gonna increase the value of score so now you will see that whenever we run the game nothing will be shown on the screen because here we have simply created a variable and we are increasing its value but it's not gonna show on the screen so in order to show it on the screen we have to create an UI text alright so to create an UI text you can go to create UI and either create a text or create a text mesh pro text so here I'm gonna simply create text but both of them gonna work so as you can see here we have the text and we cannot see it in the scene. So go to this gear icon on the right and click on reset. And as you will see the position has been reset and now it is in the center. Now let's change the new text to zero so that it, uh, it shows our score. Now I'm gonna go to this alignment and click on the center and center for both. Then I'm gonna go to this font size and change it and make it much much bigger and as you can see if you double click on the text we can see where it is on the screen 
So as you can see here, it is on the screen. I can click on this rect transform tool and move it to the top center, something like this. Change the size like this. And now I can simply go ahead and change the font size even more. So let's make the size bigger like this. And now let's change the font size, something like this. Then we can change the color to white or red or anything that you would like to give. Let's give it a color like this. Or we can simply click on this color pickup tool. And then we can click on any color and it will automatically take that color. So let's go ahead and click on this one. And as you can see, it took that color. I can click on it here and click on this one. As you can see, it took that color again. So this way I can change it to any color that I want. I think I'm going to give it a color like this, a little more yellowish perhaps, something like this. So this should work. So now this is what will store our score text on the screen. So now we need to connect this UI element to our score value in the code so that we can show the code or show the score on the screen. So let's rename it to score text. Now let's go back to our code and here we're going to write another public thing. So here we're going to write public game object not game object here we need to write public text not text alignment public text score text so we are creating a variable of type text but as you can see it is showing in red because the text does not exist in the current namespace so in order to use the ui elements here we need to write using unity engine not editor engine dot ui all right so now as you can see the error is gone so whenever we are going to use this using unity engine dot ui namespace then we can use all the ui functionalities from it so this way here we have created a public text variable named score text now every time whenever we are increasing the value of score here we can write score text score text dot text equals score so now we are simply saying that the text property or the text value of our score text element will be set to this score value so if the score value is 0, it will show 0 on the screen. If the score value is 1, it will show 1 on the screen. If it is 2, it will show 2 on the screen. But the problem is this text is a string property. And this score variable that we have created is an integer. Alright? So we have to convert from integer to string in order to make this or write this code without any errors. To do that, the simplest way to do that is to write score dot to string, and that's it. So this will simply convert our score to a score integer to a string value, and then it will set it as the text property of our score text. So now everything almost done in the code. Now one more thing to do is we need to select our tank. And as you can see, our script is expecting this score text property here. So here we need to simply drag and drop this score text element from our canvas right here. So drag and drop this score text, that is the score text that we have created to the canvas right here. Not to the canvas, to the example script's score text property right here. So now our script has access to this score text element. And now if I click on play, you will see every time I go ahead and collect one object, the score will be incremented. One, two, three, and four. So this way, as you can see, every time I collect an object, the score gets incremented. And this is how we can change the score and show it on the screen as well. And 
all these things are gonna be very very useful whenever you're gonna create any kind of game so these are the useful and important things that you can use almost in every game that you create so now let's learn one more thing so when we destroy all the boxes we want to reload the game or restart the game again so that we can play it from the beginning again so whenever our score reaches 4 and we have destroyed all the boxes we want to reload or restart the game scene so in this case we have to restart the game scene so let's see how we can restart the game scene using c sharp so as you can see we have our scene named as game and if you go to file build settings as you can see our scene is not included in the build here so from here we're gonna write we're gonna click on add open scenes and now as you can see our game scene is added to the build we don't need this sample scene that i have created before but make sure that whatever scene you are working with is added in the build settings otherwise you will not be able to load it from your c sharp code so now with that done let's go back to our code and in order to use all the functionalities for reloading and restarting the scene we have to use another namespace here. So here we need to write using unity engine dot scene management not c scene. I'm not sure what happened. Dot scene management. All right. So now that we have written this dot scene management, now we can use all the functions related to reloading the scene. So here, as you can see, every time we are colliding with it, we are checking that uh, the we're checking if the score is getting incremented. So here we are simply incrementing the score and showing or displaying it on our screen. So here we need to check whenever the score is greater than or equal to four, then we want to reload our scene. All right. So for reloading our scene, let's create another different function so that we can call it from anywhere that we want. So here we're going to create void restart. So this is the function inside which we're going to write our code to reload the scene. So here we're going to write scene manager dot load scene and what scene we want to load? We want to load the scene named game that is our current scene so in your case the scene name probably be different so make sure you write it exactly as it is written right here or you can go to the scenes folder where we have saved the scenes and as you can see here this name of the scene is game so you can write it exactly as it is as it is written here otherwise it will not work so in my case whenever the restart function gets called this load scene function will get called and it will load the game scene. Now we need to call this restart function from here. All right. So from here, we're going to check if score is greater than equals four because we have four different boxes. So when we destroy all the four different boxes and our score is four or more, then we want to call this restart function so now whenever our tank has destroyed all the four boxes and our score is greater than four the greater than or equal to four the restart function will get called and our game will simply be restarted so let's save the scene go back to unity and see how it's working so let's go ahead and destroy the blocks so one two three and four and as you can see as soon as i destroyed the fourth block the game has got restarted and we are here again so this is how we can call the different scene management functions to reload and restart the scene again now as you can see you will notice that whenever i touch this block exactly at that time the game gets restarted but I think that's not what we want. What we want is whenever we win the game, we wait for one or two seconds and to and celebrate our victory. <laughs> and after that, 
we reload or restart the scene. So we need to learn a way so that we can call this restart function after a delay. So we need to find some, some way so that we can call this restart function after one or two seconds with a delay. All right. So in Unity, it's very easy to do that by using the invoke function. So first of all, let me go ahead and comment this out because we are going to do it in a different way. So here we can write invoke. So this invoke function helps us to call any other function after a certain amount of time. So first of all, inside the string or inside double quotations, we need to write the name of the function that we want to invoke. So here we want to use this restart. So I'm going to select and copy it. And it's a good idea to copy it because it will help us from preventing any errors. Oops, not this one. So restart, copy, paste it, and here. So here, as you can see, first parameter we have given restart. Now for the second parameter, we can give a comma and now we need to write after how much time we want to restart it. So in this case, let's say I want to restart after two seconds. All right. So whenever the score is greater than or equal to four, we're going to wait for two seconds and then we're going to invoke the restart function. And what does the restart function does? It simply reloads the scene. So now let's go back to Unity. And if I click on run and destroy the blocks, so one, two, three, and four, one, two. So as you can see, just after two seconds has passed, our game gets reloaded again and restarted again, and we can play it from the beginning one more time. So let's go through it one more time. So one, two, three, four and restart. So as you can see, it waits for two many seconds. And after that, it simply restarts the game and reloads the game. And as I have said before, you need to make sure that in the file build settings, you have added your current scene. Otherwise, this reload functionality will not work. All right. So this way we have also learned how we can reload and restart the game. We have learned how we can reload a level. Also, we have learned how we can add some delay so that we can reload our game after a little delay or after a specified amount of time. So this way we have learned how to use C Sharp scripting in Unity to do some essential things. So all the things that I have shown you here, you're going to use them almost in every single game project that you're going to create. So these are some essential functionalities that I wanted to talk about in this video. So I hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot from this video. So thank you so much. So if you want to learn more and create some more cool projects, you can check out my complete C Sharp scripting for Unity game development course. In my course, I have 25 plus hours of long videos and there you will get everything you need to create awesome games with C Sharp and Unity and everything that you need to learn about C Sharp. There you're going to learn about all the C Sharp fundamentals, all the Unity fundamentals from absolute basics. You will learn to create inputs for Android and mobile devices. You will learn to implement Unity ads. You will learn to uh, create achievement unlock systems and leaderboards and you will learn to create some basic game AI and along with that so I will discuss about the intermediate topics like object oriented programming and uh, things like that. Also you're going to create two complete 2D and 3D games that you can show up to your friends or show in your portfolio and do uh, anything that you want. So this will give you a lot more experience. So I hope you will really enjoy taking this course. So you can check the link to my course from the description of this video and you'll get a huge discount if you take it from the link of the description. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you really enjoyed. If you really like this video, make sure to give it a like 
and make sure to subscribe to this channel if you want to get more of these videos so thank you so much make sure to check out my course from the link in the description below and i'm going to see you in another video hey there welcome this is raja from charger games and i'm making a video after a lot of days so sorry for that so in this video we're gonna learn how to create awesome infinite scrolling backgrounds for your games that you can use for your runner games for your platformer games i think it is mainly for your runner games or scrolling games where you will scroll infinitely and you need an infinite scrolling background and as you can see here we have two different things that are moving in two different speeds so that gives a parallax effect it though it is 2d it gives us a 3d or depth effect of depth so that it looks like this is the foreground and this is the background because both of them are moving in different speed so we're gonna learn how to do that in this video so let's get started now I created uh, a video on this topic I think that was three years ago so I simply wanted to create an updated version of this so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new scene first of all and I will save this scene inside my here and I'm gonna name it scrolling now I will use some of the assets that I have downloaded from the Kenny website I guess all of you know about Kenny.nl that is the best website to get any of your 2d game artworks and also 3d as well most of them are free so these are the assets that I'm gonna use and as I've said I have downloaded them from Kenny.nl website and I have actually purchased them as a pack though they are available as free as well so now I'm gonna use some of the tiles I will use this one and I think this one and this one you can definitely use any one you want and I'm gonna drag and drop it inside my assets folder here now if you don't want to use this tiled small images you can definitely use full backgrounds of big size that's gonna work the same way so here as you can see we have three of these things now we're gonna see how we can use them in our game now if we drag and drop these things in our game as you can see they are here and they are imported as a sprite 2d and ui because this is a uh, 2d game but if it was a 3d game then it it would have been imported as a texture okay now when we use sprites we cannot definite we cannot generally uh, use them as a texture of on any of our 3d objects so if we cannot use it as a texture then we will not be able to actually scroll our background the efficient way that we want to do in this case so what i want to do is i want to select all of my sprites and from the texture type i'm gonna make them default and when I make them default, that pretty much means that that will be imported as a texture. So I can click on apply and they will be imported as a texture. So now what we need to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new 3D object and quad. And as you can see here, I have my quad. I will right click and reset its position to 0, 0, 0 and i'm gonna go ahead and delete the mesh collider because it's a 2d game and we don't need a 3d mesh collider now one thing you will see is that let me go ahead and uh, disable the icon of the camera because that's not looking good so one thing you will see that if i go ahead and drag and drop my brick texture over this one you will see that now the brick has become a texture over our sprite you can probably see that in the game view but because uh, we don't have any light it is looking very dark so to fix that what we can do is we can select our texture we can select our quad and as you can see here we have already uh, got a texture already got a shader so we can uh, expand that and go to this shader option and from here you can go to unlit and texture so when you select this unlit texture it pretty much means that your texture or your shader will not be affected by any of the lights in the scene so no matter if it is dark no matter if we have light it will always stay the same like this because because we have set it to unlit texture okay 
Now, when we are doing all these things, it's better to create a new material ourselves and do these things manually. So, so instead of dragging, instead of simply dragging the texture over it, I'm going to create a new material for it. So I will right click, create, and I'm going to create a new material and I will name it background and I'm going to select the material. And as you can see here, we have an option called albedo of the material. In the albedo, I will drag and drop this brick gray texture. Okay. So now this material uses this texture as its own texture, as you can see here. And now again, I'm going to go ahead into the shader and from the unlit, I will select texture. So now this is going to be like this. And now I'm going to drag this material instead of texture to this brick right here. And if you select the brick, as you can see, now we have the background material on the brick. Now, one thing you will see that our background is very, very small. And this is definitely not what we want. So I'm going to select my quad. And from the scale, I will change the scale to 10 on the X and 10 on the Y. I think I need to make it bigger. So I'm going to make 20 on X and 20 on Y. So now as you can see, our quad is big enough. But one single tile has scaled up to fill the whole texture, fill the whole quad. But we definitely don't want that. We want, as we had done before, just like this, when we had one single, uh, when we had a quad of one unit, as you can see, the texture was looking fine. So what I want to do is, I want to make this texture repeat one by one by one throughout the whole quad. So let's go to here and make it 20. If we want to make it repeat throughout the whole quad, then we need to go back to our texture settings. And from here, as you can see, wrap mode is set to clamp. We're going to select that and set it to repeat. Okay. So, and then click on apply. So when we have set the wrap mode to repeat, now we'll be able to make it repeat. So select our quad. And if you go to the background material, you will see here we have something called tiling. That means how many of these tiles will stay throughout this quad. So as you can see for the quad, we have given 20 on the X and 20 on the Y. So here in the tile as well, we're going to give 20 on the X and 20 on the Y. And as you can see, now it looks really awesome because it has tiled throughout the whole background. Now, here as you can see here, we have another option called offset. So this offset means how much the tile is offsetting from its current position. So if I go ahead and change the X offset of the tile, as you can see, it seems the tile is moving. So just by changing the X offset on the negative and the positive side, we can simply make the tile moving. We can also make the tile moving by simply changing the Y offset on the up and down direction. So these are the two ways by which we can offset and move the tile. So now we're going to go ahead and write a script to do this from a script. So I will right click and create a new C sharp script and I will name it background scroll and I'm going to open it in mono develop, uh, not mono develop. We are using visual studio now. So I'm going to open it in visual studio. So now here, what we need is first of all, as you can see here, we need to, we need to change this thing manually. We need to change this offset value manually. And this is part of the material that we, that we have attached to the quad. So what we need to do is, first of all, we need to get access to the material that is attached to the quad. And after getting access to the material, we need to change this offset of the quad, offset of the material. Okay. So first of all, here I will create a new material, material variable. So this is a variable of type material, which can store any material type of object. So inside this material, we will store the reference to the material of our game object, material that is attached to our background game object. So here I will go, to, I will create void awake function. And inside awake, I will say material equals get component renderer 
renderer dot material so what we'll do is this will give me access to the renderer component and from the renderer component we will be able to access the material and then finally it stores the reference inside this material variable so now we have access to the material of that is attached to this game object inside this material variable so just by using this material variable now we'll be able to change anything we want on our game object on our texture so now what we need to do is as you can see in order to set the offset we need to first of all tell it how much we want to change the offset as you can see currently it is zero so we want to change it and we want to give options so that we can change it in x and y both directions so that is why we will create a vector2 variable we will create a vector2 offset variable so this is the vector2 offset variable inside which we will store how much we want to offset in x and y direction and here we will create two public variables and this one will be public int x velocity and y velocity so these are the two variables inside which we want to store by how much speed we want to move the background and depending on that speed we will create our offset and depending on the offset we will change the offset of the material so in the start i will say offset equals new vector to x velocity y velocity so using the velocity variables we will create the offset vector to uh, variable now comes the most important part inside the update we need to modify this offset value with this uh, offset vector offset vector to variable that we have created here so uh, we already have access to the material from the material we need to get access to the offset and in order to get access to the offset here we need to simply write material dot main texture offset so when we write main texture offset it gives us access to the offset of that texture so as you can see this main texture offset is a property it has a get and set accessor so just by writing equal sign we can set this texture to we can set this texture offset to any value that we give so here what we want to do is we want to do plus equals offset so and we're going to multiply it by time dot delta time so here we are adding the offset value multiplied by time dot delta time to our main texture offset and then we are initializing or then we are actually assigning that value to the main texture offset again so this plus equals pretty much means first of all we are doing plus and then we are assigning it the new value okay so here as you can see we are multiplying the offset by time dot delta time time dot delta time pretty much means time taken to update the last frame so this is pretty much all we need to move our background so let's go to our unity and i'm gonna drag and drop this background script on our quad so i'm gonna select the quad and drag and drop this background script and in the background as you can see we have x velocity and in the y velocity now we can give them values depending on how much we want to move the uh, texture in x and y direction let's give the x value to 2 and now if i run it now you will see our background pretty much is moving and if you go here and from the 2d mode if you select 3d mode if you click on this 2d and by clicking by right clicking alt button on your keyboard you can drag it and rotate it and as you can see that we are not actually moving the background we are simply wrapping the background around the texture and we are offsetting it again and again and again and because the background is repeatable and tileable it looks like we are actually moving and it constantly gets rotated and wrapped around the texture wrapped around the 3d quad for how much time we actually keep it so this is how it actually works now one thing you will notice is that if i want to when i run the game 
if I want to change the value of the X from here, as you can see, though I change the value, it doesn't give any effect on this background. That's because we are setting it only once in the start. If I want to give this, you want to change this value and make it effect to the background, I can go to my start function, copy this code and put it inside update and simply go ahead and comment this one out. So now every time we give a new value that will be updated inside the update function to our offset value. So now if I go to unity, if I run it, now you will see here we are moving with two speed. If I change it to something bigger like five, as you can see it moves faster. If I move it to 10, it moves faster and now I can make it zero and it doesn't move. Now I can give a velocity to Y, let's say 2, 4, and as you can see, it moves faster. Now I can give both of them velocities, and as you can see, it moves something like this. It moves diagonally, and I can give negative values to this one as well, so that it moves on this direction, and it moves on this direction as well. So this is how we can manipulate these values to give them any effect that we want. Now this is the basic of how we can remove the background. Now what if we want to create a parallax effect and create another foreground in front of that where we want to move it with a move the texture with a um, what can I say with a faster value, faster speed value. So let's see how we can do that. For that, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new 3D object and quad. And as you can see here, we have our quad and I'm gonna go ahead and reset its position and now as you can see we cannot see it because the z value is 0 and z value is 0 here as well so what I can do is for the second quad I'm gonna make the z value negative 1 so that it comes closer to the camera now I will go and position it somewhere like this somewhere like this so here we have our quad and now we need to use another texture on this quad and for that I'm gonna use this texture so now let's go ahead and create our second material so I'm gonna right click and create a new material I will name it foreground and by selecting it inside its albedo I will drag and drop this gemstone or whatever it is named and from here I will set the shader to unlit texture so that it becomes a little bit lighter then I'm gonna drag and drop it on our quad and as you can see now it looks pretty good it looks something like this now one thing I have noticed in newer versions of unity I think I have noticed in Unity 2018 itself, I'm not sure when this version, when this thing was available, I can see that even if I make it a sprite 2D and UI, I still have a repeat texture mode from here. So I, I'm not sure why, or from when they have used or introduced this feature. So what I can say is that in Unity 2018 and newer versions, even if you set it as sprite 2D and UI, even then you can set its repeat mode, set its wrap mode to repeat. So you don't need to make it a texture or default one. So if you click on apply, as you can see, this is still the same because these things work the same way. So now the next thing we need to do, we need to select the quad, set its X and Y value, set its X value to zero. And we need to set its scale to, I think, 20. So previously you have seen that we were setting the x and y both of the scales 20 20 but this time we want to scale the we want to make the x scale only 20 and we want to set the y scale to 1 itself and this time we will do the tiling in a different way so if you select the second quad go to the foreground material now we will set the x tiling to 20 and we will keep the y tiling to 1 because we don't want to tile in the y direction because we only have one quad in the y but 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 in the x we have a lot of quads okay so as you can see now it looks good only thing only one thing that we need to do is we need to simply go ahead and create another material which we can put down here so i'm gonna go ahead and create new material 
material and I'm going to name it foreground 2 and in the foreground 2 I will drag and drop this one and I will set unlit texture and here I'm going to duplicate this squad I think I think I'm going to duplicate this squad so duplicate it and now I'm going to put it right below it here and this time instead of using this material I will drag and drop the new foreground to material that we have created so foreground true drag and drop over it and as you can see here as well we need to tile it because it is tiled wrongly so I'm going to go to the material and make the X tiling 20 and keep the Y tiling to 1 because we don't need that there and as you can see here we have some problem in this image that because we have not set the wrap mode to repeat so let's select this image go to here and select our wrap mode to repeat and click on apply and now as you can see it will be repeated now as you can see there we have a little bit of gap between both of these so let's select the second one click the V key or we need to set this one I think and then press the V key let's move it a little bit down and we'll be able to easily manipulate and move it to any other vertex just by using V key so let me show it to one more time press the V key select this one and simply drag it to clamp it here so now I can select both of these squads and simply move them down a little bit just like this now the only thing that we need to do is we need to select both of these squads and drag and drop our background scroll script to both of them and previously in our first squad we had the X velocity to 2 so in both of these squads we are gonna set the X velocity to 4 so that it looks like it moves faster so now if I go ahead and run it and you will see that we have both of these things and both of these things are moving faster and it gives us a parallax effect it looks like this one moves faster this one moves slower so it gives us a look of a 3d like game so one last thing I'm gonna do is this so here I have few of the sprites you can use any sprites you want I'm gonna select all the sprites and I'm going to select all the sprites and I will simply drag and drop it in our scene and you will see it will automatically create an animation so I'm going to go to here and save it as run animation now as you can see our player will run whenever we put it here so I'm going to put it right about here and now if I run it you will see our player is running though it's running very slow so it looks like it's not actually running correctly so to fix that I can go to window and animation I have the animation set here so as you can see currently the sample size is 12 that is because the that is why the animation is running so slow so let's go ahead and make the sample size from 12 to 30 and if I play it now as you can see it runs faster so when you write 30 after that you need to make enter otherwise it will not be saved so this time if I go to my game view and click on play now as you can see it looks like the player is running and I think I need to change the speed of the foregrounds a little bit so I'm gonna select them and make the velocity I think 8 and this one looks pretty good I'm gonna select the background and I think for the background I'm gonna make it 4 or I think 2 is good 2 or 3 I think 3 is good so let's keep it at this position and it looks like our player is running and it is ready to create a new 3d runner game so I hope uh, I think this is all for this video so I hope you really enjoyed this video and learned a lot so thank you very very much for watching this is Raja from charger games and you are seeing me after a lot of days so if you like this video please give me a like and make sure to subscribe to my channel because I'm coming up with a lot of new videos and go to my channel and check out all my other videos that you will love so thanks for watching let me know in the comments what you think about this tutorial and thanks for watching I'm gonna see you in the next videos hey there this is Raja from charger games and welcome back to this video I know a lot of you want to learn how to move your objects in mobile devices using touch inputs now in this video I'm gonna show you how to do it in the simplest way and the fastest way so if you want to learn I hope you're really excited 
let's get started so here inside my sprites folder i have an image of this cute little panda so i'm gonna go ahead and drag and drop it on our hierarchy now we're gonna go to the scale tool and change its scale to 0 0.5 in the x and 0.5 in the y as well so that it becomes like this then we can simply move it down somewhere like this all right now we're going to go to our main camera and change the color to something warm or funny or something that looks more positive than black so something like this should be okay so now what we want to do is when the game runs in our mobile device Basically, what you want to do is when we touch the left part of our mobile device screen, we want this object to move towards left. So when we touch to the left, we want this to be like this. And when we touch towards the right part of our mobile screen, we want this to go like this. Okay, so this is what we basically want. So we want to move this object using left and right touching on our mobile device. So for that, I'm going to go inside my scripts folder and create a new C sharp script and I'm going to name this one touch move tutorial. Now I'm going to select my panda and drag and drop the touch move tutorial script on it and then double click to open it in Visual Studio. So here we have our script. All right. So now first thing we need is we need to have a move speed value by which we can move our player. So here we're going to create public float move speed variable and make sure to create a public variable because we want to actually change its values from the editor. All right. Now here we're going to create a separate function for touch movement so that we can use that to move our player. So here we're going to write void touch move. Now if you want you can also write it directly inside the update or fixed update but in this case, we want to write all our code inside the touch move so that you can simply use the function and call it from anywhere to move your object using touch inputs. Or let's say you have multiple types of inputs in your game. So you have one function inside which you write the code for keyboard inputs, another one you write for the touch move, and you can use any of them depending on where you are using it. Okay. Now, in order to use the touch movement, let's see how we can do that. First of all, we need to actually get the position where we are touching. Now, I want to say that in this case, we are not going to use the actual touch functionalities of Unity. We're going to use the mouse input functionalities in Unity because the mouse inputs work directly as touch inputs without any problem. Now, some of you might say that this is not the correct way to do this, but this works. And it, if it works in your case, you should definitely use it because it's easy to use and it works perfectly. All right. So first of all, we need to detect whether we have pressed a finger on the screen. Okay. And in order to detect that, we need to say if input dot get mouse button zero. All right. So you need to make sure that you write get mouse button and not button down or button up because button down is called whenever you click your button and button up is called when you receive or not receive when you leave your button okay but this get mouse button function gets called as long as you keep pressing your button or as long as you keep touching on the screen so in this case that's what we want to do we want to we want to check how long the player is touching on the screen and during that time we want to move our player so here we are detecting the zeroth mouse button whether we have pressed it and this is similar to touching on the screen okay so this code works for clicking the mouse as well as pressing on the screen so both of these works okay so this will return true as long as you have pressed your mouse or kept touching on the screen okay so now that we have got to know whether we are pressing on the screen or not now we need to know where we are actually pressing on the screen whether we are pressing on the left direction or on the left side of the screen or we are pressing on the right side of our screen in order to detect that first of all we need to get the mouse position so here we're gonna say vector3 mouse pose so this is a new variable inside which we're gonna store our mouse position now in order to use the mouse position in our actual project we need to convert it from screen point to world point so by default unity gives us the mouse position in the screen coordinates 
but if we want to use it in our game we need to convert it into world coordinates okay in the world coordinates the center is zero and the left is negative and the right is positive that's what we want to detect so that's why we need to convert our mouse position into world coordinates to do that we're gonna say camera dot main dot screen to world point and write it exactly as I have written otherwise it will give you errors and this is the function that we need and inside the function we need to simply pass our mouse position so here we're gonna say input dot mouse position okay so now this function will take our mouse position and convert it from screen to world coordinate and then return the mouse position inside this mouse pose variable so now inside the mouse pose variable we have access to our mouse position now we need to detect whether the mouse position or the touch position is currently on the left of our screen or on the right of our screen so let me go to unity and uh, a little bit give you a little demonstration so that you can understand what I'm talking about so currently as you can see here we have our panda and in the world coordinates this is the center part of our screen now the left axis the left and right axis is the X axis and that's why we want to move our player so we want to move our player like this and this now if this is the center then if the player is touching anywhere on the left of the center like here 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 then we want to move our player to the left and if it is touching on the right side of our screen anywhere like this 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 we want to move our player to the right direction so if this is the zero this is the center then this one will be negative one negative two negative three negative four like this and this one will be positive one positive two positive three positive four like this so we need to check if the touch position is less than zero that is it is minus negative one negative two or anything like that then we're gonna move it to the left and if it is greater than zero that is if it is one two three four then we're gonna move our player to the right so that's what we're gonna do so let's go ahead and double click to open our script again and here we're gonna say if mouse pose dot x that means if the x position of our mouse is less than okay first of all let's say if greater than 0 0.2 f 0 0.2 but you can also say if greater than 1 that means if it is greater than 1 that means whether we are pressing on the right side of our screen then we need to simply move right okay else if mouse pose dot x is less than negative 1 then we're gonna move left as simple as that now we need to simply say how do we want to move it to the right and how we want to move it to the left now there are various ways by which you can move if you are using physics you can use velocity otherwise you can use translate function you can use the transform dot position to move it directly so in this case we're going to use the easiest way that is transform dot translate function so for moving to the right we're going to say transform dot translate translate and now here we need to pass how much we want to move in the x y and z direction so here we want to move only in the x axis and on the right side that is in the positive axis that's why here we're gonna say move speed so in the x axis we want to move by this move speed amount in the y axis we're gonna move zero in the z axis we're gonna move zero so by this code our player will be moved to the right side with this move speed whenever we are pressing on the right side of our screen the same way if we simply copy this code and paste it here when we want to move to the left we simply need to make the move speed value to negative and that's it so just by making the move speed value to negative now our player will move in the negative direction in the x-axis okay so now our code is ready our touch move function is ready all we need to do is call this touch move function from our update or fixed update function so in this case I'm gonna call it from the fixed update function so void fixed update and inside this I'm gonna call this touch move function alright so now this function will get called again and again and it will check whether we are pressing and where we are pressing and depending on that it will move our player left and right so let me go ahead and save the script and go back to unity and here we're gonna now test how this thing is working now before testing we need to make sure we add a speed value to this panda 
So here let's say I give a speed value of 0 0.5 and now I can click on play and now you will see when I press the left side of the screen it moves to the left when I press the right side of the screen it moves to the right and this doesn't only work for mouse it works for touch as well so whether you are using a mobile device or a tablet anything that you want this will work similarly in all the cases now if you press on the center you will see nothing will happen because in our code we have written that the click or the position will be the position should be at least greater than positive one or less than negative one otherwise this code will not work or it will not detect the clicks or move the player okay so now that you can see the code is working now i'm going to also show you how this works in the mobile device by using the device simulator so that you can see how it works so let me go to the device simulator and in your case if you don't have the device simulator you need to actually install it from the package manager and I will create a separate video on that so don't worry about it I'm gonna create a separate video on that and I'm gonna choose the Redmi Note 7 for this and I'm gonna rotate it just like this and now if I click on play and now let me wait for it to load and now as you can see in the device simulator as well I can press the left and right and the panda moves to left and right just like this okay so as you can see our code is working for mobile device as well and this is working here as well so this is the simplest way to do it simplest way to actually code the movement now some of you might argue that this is not the perfect way to do touch inputs and that's that's quite true but if it works for your project and if it doesn't give any errors then you should use it because it's the easiest way to do it you don't need to deal with touch arrays and all that stuff because this thing works all right and you can do the same thing inside update function so as you can see if i open the script here as you can see i have done it inside the fixed update function i have called it inside the fixed update function but if you want to call it inside the update function you can do so as well but in that case you need to simply multiply your move speed with time dot delta time okay so let me show you how to do that you can simply copy this code paste it here comment it out from here and here after the move speed you need to multiply it with time dot delta time the same way you need to multiply this one with time dot delta time and this is it so this way your code will work in the update function as well now you need to go back to unity and simply change the move speed value and make it a higher value so that it works perfectly in your case so here inside the move speed i'm going to make it let's say 10 and let's see how this works and now you will see with the 10 value it works like this and it works pretty good okay so this way you can use it in the update or fixed update anywhere that you want uh, according to your project and which one, whichever one gives you the correct results Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot. So go ahead and use it in your own projects and build some more cool things. So if you enjoyed this video and learned something, please hit the like button so that I can make more videos about it. And let me know in the comments down below what do you like to watch more in the next videos. And if you like the tutorial, let me know in the comments as well. Thank you so much for watching. This is Raja and I'm going to see you in a new video tomorrow. Hi everyone, this is Raja from Charger Games and welcome back to this video. So in this video, we're going to learn about Unity by building a fully working game in a very short time. I hope you're really excited. So let's get started. So here I have opened up a new 3D empty Unity project. You can go ahead and open that. And then I have changed the layout from default to 2x3. So if you are in default layout, you can simply change it to 2x3 layout, then you will be good to go. Now we will need a few things for this game. First of all, we need a we need a 3D ball model, you can download it from anywhere. Also, we need a texture for the ground that you can also download from anywhere. Now, you can simply go ahead and go to Google and uh, write seamless grass texture and download any of the seamless grass textures. And for the ball, I have gone to this Unity Asset Store and from there I have picked up this free soccer ball. You can go ahead and use any other ball that you want to. Whenever you are ready, simply click on open in Unity and then it will be opened here from the package manager simply click on import and import and this way you will be able to import this soccer ball in your project 
so as you can see now we have it right here inside the soccer ball folder so from here I'm gonna go to this prefabs folder here we have the soccer ball simply go ahead and drag and drop it right here on the scene and as you can see here we have our soccer ball we can simply zoom in by rotating our mouse wheel and this is where our soccer ball is we can also press the F key to focus on it and then zoom out like this alright so here we have our soccer ball now if you want you can use it simply like this or you can change its materials so I'm gonna go ahead and change its materials a little bit this is optional just because I want it so as you can see when you select the soccer ball here you have the materials list from this I'm gonna select this black ball material and simply go ahead and change its albedo to a something different color something like red or uh, something like that because I prefer this color so let's keep it like this so once you have done that now we need to create the ground where the ball can rest but before that let's select our soccer ball and as you can see here we have a sphere collider attached already that means the ball can collide with other objects now we also need to add a rigid body component to the ball so I'm gonna go to add component physics and then I'm gonna click a click on this rigid body so now the ball can interact with physics objects in the scene okay so now let's go ahead and move the ball a little bit upwards and let's create our new ground so for that I'm gonna go ahead and create a 3d object cube and this cube is going to be our ground so let's move it down a little bit so here we have our cube now I'm gonna go ahead and make its X scale to let's say uh, 10 and not 10 let's say 5 and the z scale to let's say 20 okay so this is how this cube is going to be now as you can see this blue line is our z axis or our forward axis so you should always rotate your camera so that your z axis is at the front direction so to rotate your camera or rotate your view what you can do is press the alt key on your keyboard pressing the alt key you can press the left mouse button and then you can rotate the view like this okay so press alt key left mouse button and rotate it like this so now as you can see we can see the front axis and looks like our player is ready to roll so let's go ahead and uh, rename this one to ground so ground now let's go ahead and, and add a texture to our ground so as you can see I have already downloaded a grass texture not here I have already downloaded a grass texture that you can simply drag and drop here to create a new material or you can do what you can do is you can go to your materials folder right click and create a new material and name it grass and then inside that albedo of that grass simply drag and drop the texture and that way as well you can create a new material and then you can drag the grass texture right here okay so now as you can see it looks pretty odd so to fix this what we can do is we can select our ground go to the grass material and from the texture tiling let's set the X to 4 and Y to 4 as well so now as you can see it looks pretty good because it has tiled <laughs> greatly and now it looks pretty good you can also go ahead and change few other properties to make it look a little bit better you can change the smoothness like this you can make it lower to make it look better you can also change the metallic property but I think I'm gonna keep it like this okay so now that we have our ground and ball ready let's move the ball a little bit upwards and now when I press play you will see the ball will fall down so now as you can see whenever we press play the ball falls down alright so now that we have our ball and ground ready it's time to make our ball move and create the player controller so inside our assets let's create a new folder called scripts create a new folder called scripts and inside the scripts folder I'm gonna right click create a new C sharp script and I'm gonna name this one player controller and then I'm gonna select my soccer ball and drag and drop the player controller right over it alright so now we have the player controller attached let's double click to open it in Visual Studio first of all let's go ahead and create the few variables that we have here that we need here so first of all we need a speed by which we our ball can move for that we're gonna create a public float move speed variable then we will of course need to take the inputs and for that we're gonna create two new variables float X input and of course we need a semicolon here and float Y input 
and I'm gonna make this X small all right so this will take the input from the left and right arrow keys and also from the up and down arrow keys so that we can move our wall then we will need an access to the rigid body component that we have attached to our ball so for that we're gonna create a new variable rigid body RB so these are the variables that we need for right now now inside the start we're gonna say RB equals get component rigid body so now we will have access to the rigid body that we have attached to our game object inside this RB variable so whatever we want to do we want to add force we want to make it jump whatever we want to do we can do it just by using this RB variable alright so now inside the update we're gonna take our inputs so for X input we're gonna say X input equals input dot get access horizontal so this horizontal axis automatically will give us input from the left and right arrow keys or from the A and D arrow keys on our keyboard. And for the Y input, we're going to say equals input dot get axis vertical. So this vertical will give us input from the up and down arrow keys. So whether we are pressing the up key or whether we are pressing the down arrow key and depending on that it will give us the value and using that value we can move we can make our player move left and right up and down or front and back so now that we have the input what we can do is we can move move our player using physics inside the fixed update function so we're gonna write void fixed update and inside the fixed update function we're gonna say rv dot add force so we're gonna add force to our ball and by doing that we can actually move our ball now First of all, we're going to make our ball move left and right. And for that, we're going to give a value to the x-axis. So for the x-axis, we're going to say x input multiplied by move speed. Now for the y-axis, we're going to give the value 0. Because we don't want to make our ball move up and down. We only want to make our ball move left and right and front and back. So that's why no value to y. And for the z as well, we're going to write y input multiplied by move speed okay so just by doing that we can make our ball move all right now let's do one more thing whenever the ball falls down from the ground let's make it reset let's reset the level and start the level again so that we can restart the game for that here we're gonna say if transform dot position dot y is less than equals to minus 5f that means whenever the ball falls down and goes below 5, we're going to reset the level. And how can we reset the level? To reset the level, we need to write scene, scene manager dot load scene. And here we're going to write 0. That means the scene at 0th index. Because this is our first level, that's why we can write 0 and it will work. Now as you can see here, we have this red line and that is because we have not imported the scene management. So on the top, we need to write using unity engine dot scene management so now that we have written this now whenever the ball will fall down it will reset the level so now that we have the script written let's go ahead and save this and go back to unity all right so here we are back inside unity let's go ahead and play but before that let's select our soccer ball and give a speed to our move speed variable so that our ball can move so for the start let's give it a speed of 10 or 15 I say let's say 10 and let's click on play and see how it's working so 10 speed click here now as you can see I can make my ball move left and right up and down like this and I can move my ball forward or backward but not on the up and down axis only left and right and front and back and now whenever I fall down let's see what happens whenever I fall down automatically the ball restarts because the level gets reloaded so whenever I fall down automatically the level gets reloaded and the game gets restarted so we have created the very basic of this now what we need to do is we need to set the camera make the camera follow the ball and then create a small level so that we can play it okay so now let's go ahead and make the camera and adjust the camera so that we can follow the ball so I'm gonna select my main camera and as you can see here we have our main camera if we retreat our view here we have our main camera and this is the game view the thing that you can see on the bottom is our game view so whatever you are seeing here this is the this is what we can see in our game this is not this is the scene view where we can edit it but this is the thing that we can use that you can see in our game so from that first of all let's select this free aspect and choose 1920 by 1080 or full HD resolution 
so that our game gets into full resolution okay so now this is the resolution that you're going to use for our game once you have done that now let's adjust the camera a little bit let's select the main camera move it to the front something like this somewhere like this and then we can make it a little bit upwards something like this and then we can go to this rotation and change the x rotation of the camera to let's say 20 or something like that so once we have done that i think this should be okay for our game i think this should be okay for our game so now that we have it now we need to make our camera follow our ball always so that wherever it goes our camera always follows the ball so inside our scripts folder we're gonna go ahead and create a new c sharp script and we're gonna name this one camera follow now i'm gonna select my main camera and and drag and drop the camera follow script right here now let's double click to open the camera follow script in visual studio and let's start writing our code so the first thing we need is we need a target which we can follow so for that here we're going to create a public variable public transform target and then inside start we will actually calculate the difference between our ball's position and our camera's position and we will keep that position or keep that difference always same so that our camera keeps following the ball always for that here we're going to create a new variable called vector 3 offset so this will be the difference or the distance between our target and our camera in our start we're going to say offset equals target dot position minus transform dot position so this offset is the distance between our targets position and our cameras position and then inside our fixed update what you're gonna do is we're gonna make the camera always follow the ball at this offset or the camera should be always at this distance from our player for that here we're gonna write transform dot position equals target dot position minus offset so that always the camera will be at this distance from our target or our player so the camera will always keep following the ball so now that we have this let's go back to unity and now let's select our main camera here as you can see it is waiting for the target so in the target we're gonna drag and drop our soccer ball or our player whatever you have right here so now that we have this let's go ahead and click on play and see how this is working so now as you can see whenever the ball moves automatically the camera moves along with it as well so whenever the ball moves left and right front and back the camera automatically moves along with it so our camera follow code is working all right so now that we have our camera follow code working now we need to make the level a little bit bigger and create some coins so that the player can actually collect the coins all right so for that first of all let's go ahead and make the level a little bit bigger so as you can see here we have our first ground i'm gonna go ahead and right click and duplicate to create a new ground now i can simply go to this move tool and move it somewhere like this now as you can see it's not easy to actually connect both of them together because they might overlap here so what we can do is we can press the v key on our keyboard to snap from one vertex to another vertex very easily so press the v key select this vertex and drag it to snap to this vertex like this so now as you can see both of these levels have been snapped very easily now i'm going to select this ground and duplicate it one more time then I'm gonna move it here and then I'm gonna snap it here as well so I'm gonna press the V key snap it like this and then for this level I'm gonna change the X scale to 20 and change the Z scale to 5 so something like this alright so something like this and then I'm gonna put it somewhere like this and if you want to make it a little more precise then what you can do is you can simply press the V key again and snap these two portions you can rotate your view completely and then press the V key here and snap these two portions like this so this way you can do that also you can change your view by pressing the Y and go to the top view you can press the X and go to the front view and this way you can easily adjust it and then again press the alt click 
press the alt button and then rotate your mouse wheel to go to any other view that you want to all right so now that we have created this one let's create a few more things here let's go ahead and duplicate this platform duplicate this move it like this press the v key and change it to this then again from here we're gonna duplicate the ground move it forward and then we're gonna set the x to 5 and y to 20 something like this and then again from here we're gonna duplicate this platform now duplicate this one move it to the front like this and this and this and then we can press the v key and snap it like this and this can be the end position or the end point of our level all right so now that we have our level our ball can actually move to all these levels and then we can actually make the game more interesting now what you can do is i can select the main camera and make the skybox look a little better so as you can see we have the clear flags set to skybox i can go ahead and change it to solid color and then change it to a color that i want let's say a green like color something like this so this one i think looks pretty good so let's keep it like this you can go ahead and change it to any other color that you want to that's your wish so now that we have it let's go ahead and create some coins which you can collect and then we can win the game so for that here i'm gonna go ahead and create a new 3d object i'm gonna name this i'm gonna create a new cylinder so here we have a cylinder where is the cylinder let's go ahead and reset its position reset its position so here we have a cylinder now so here we have a cylinder now what you're gonna do is we can make it we can change the y scale to 0 0.5 or uh, not 0 0.5 even smaller than that because we're gonna make a coin from it so let's make it something like this i think this one looks pretty good so now that we have the coin let's go ahead and give it a material so go to the materials folder right click create a new material i'm gonna name this one coin then change its color to something like gold a golden color now i'm gonna drag and drop the coin material over our coin then i'm gonna select the coin material change its metallic value something like this and drag and drop the smoothness to make it look a little more like a coin all right so now it looks like a golden coin <laughs> and then you can also select the cylinder and change its x and z scale as well let's make it 0 0.5 0 0.5 or i think let's make it one it will be easier for the player to actually collect the coins then now as you can see the coin looks like this so we need to rotate it to make it look like actual coin for that we're gonna go and change its x rotation to 90 and now it looks like a coin let's see how big it is it's actually pretty big compared to our ball so if you want you can also make it smaller let's go ahead and change its x scale to 0 0.5 z scale to 0 0.5 as well and let's bring it down to this point in our ground so now that we have this coin we're gonna go ahead and create a new empty game object we're gonna name this one coin let's reset its position and then drag and drop our cylinder over this coin to make this cylinder a child of this coin now we're gonna re reset its position to make it a child of this coin so now we can select the coin game object and move it anywhere and then we can rotate it like this okay so now what you're gonna do is we're gonna make this coin a prefab object before that we're gonna go to this tag go to add tag and create a new tag and I'm gonna name this one coin then I'm gonna select the coin and select the coin tag from it okay so now I'm gonna go to the assets folder create a new folder I'm gonna name this one prefab the prefabs are objects which you can reuse again and again in this case we're gonna reuse the coins again and again so that is why I'm drag and dropping it I'm dragging and dropping it inside the prefabs folder and making a prefab out of it now I can select the coin make it position something like somewhere like this now it looks pretty good now let's go to our scripts folder create a new C sharp script and I'm gonna name this one coin now let's select our coin drag and drop the coin script over here 
and then double click to open it. Now the coin script is going to be very very simple. We only need a few things. First of all here we need a rotate speed. So public float rotate speed. So this is the speed by which the coin is going to rotate. Now inside the fixed update, fixed update we're gonna write transform dot rotate and this is going to rotate our coin and we're going to rotate our coin around the y axis. So we're gonna write zero for x for y we're gonna write rotate speed and for the z we're gonna write zero. Now depending on the rotation of your coin you might need to change this. You might need to keep it in the y, uh, keep it in the z or keep it in the x because your coin might be rotated differently compared to mine depending on how you have set your game. But if you have, if you have set the game exactly as I have done then this is going to work for it, fine. So now the coin is going to rotate around y and I'm gonna go back to unity select the coin let's make the rotate speed to about 5 and let's play to see how this is working so let's play alright so the coin is rotating I can make it a little bit down or let's keep it at this point now go inside the prefab folder select the coin inside the prefab and make sure you have attached the script to the prefab and not to this game object okay so what you can do is we can either attach it to this prefab separately or we can select our coin go to this overrides and click on apply all now as you can see our prefab also has this coin script attached okay so now that we have it one thing what you can do is as you can see our coin game object also has this cylinder or this capsule collider attached we're gonna go ahead and change its to a trigger okay so change it to a trigger because if it is set to a collider then what will happen is our ball will collide with it but if it is set as a trigger then our ball can go through it so it can detect collisions but it can still go through it and it will give a better behavior here now select our cylinder and make sure you have attached this coin tag to it because this is where we have the collider attached and this is why we want to add the coin tag to this collider or this cylinder inside the coin okay so once you have done that once you have done that as you can see now if I double click here our cylinder has this coin tag attached so now I can simply drag and drop and use the coins and create a cool new level so now let's go ahead and drag this coin here and as you can see here we have a coin let's move it somewhere like this something like this somewhere like this move it to a position where our ball can at least collect it fine then I'm gonna duplicate it and position it somewhere like this I think this will be a good position then I'm gonna duplicate it duplicate this coin and position it somewhere like this then I'm gonna duplicate it again position it somewhere like here at the edge and then again I'm gonna duplicate it position it at the edge right here so now one two three four five six we have six coins let's give it another one let's duplicate it and position it right about here so now we have one two three four five six seven seven coins and whenever the player collects all the seven coins we want to make the player win the game so let's go ahead and program that in our player controller so I'm gonna go to my scripts folder and open up my player controller script and now inside the update not inside the update here what you're gonna do is we're gonna create a new function we're gonna call it void on trigger enter this function gets called whenever our ball collides with another object which has a collider and the trigger turned on okay and now we have all the information related to the trigger inside this other folder so here we're gonna write other dot tag equals coin so if our player is colliding with a game object which has a coin tag attached so we're gonna write if inside if we're gonna write this condition so if we are colliding with an object which has the coin tag attached then we're gonna increment the score 
in this case we are not showing the score so here we're going to simply create a new int score variable or int coins variable coins collected variable and then we're going to say coins collected plus plus so every time it collects a coin it will check it and we'll say coins collected plus plus and whenever the value of coins whenever the coins collected is greater than equals seven that means we have collected all the coins we're gonna win the game now currently we don't have anything to show in the game so what you're gonna do is we're gonna create a new text object which will show up on the screen whenever we win the game so for now let's go ahead and save this and see if it is working in our game so now let's go ahead and play and as you can see whenever the player actually goes through the coins it can actually collect the coins can it collect okay so the player might be able to collect the coins but the coins are not actually deactivating from the scene so let's go to our player controller and whenever this happens after saying this we're gonna also say other dot game object dot set active to false because the coins were not deactivating from the scene even after we are collecting them so now let's save this go back to unity now let's click on play now you will see whenever we go through the coins the coin gets deactivated because we have already collected it so this way we can actually collect all the coins just like this and if we fall down the game will get restarted okay so things are working pretty fine now whenever the player wins the game we want to show a win text on the screen so let's see how we can do that for that here we're gonna go ahead and go to UI and create a new text mesh pro object now if you want you can also use the old text objects which is easy to set up and easy to do but if you want more features you can use this text mesh pro and you need to use the import the TMP essentials for that so as you can see I have imported them and here we have our text object if you want to use the old text objects and make it simple you can go to this UI go to this legacy and use text from here okay so here we have our text let's go ahead and reset its position to the center somewhere like this and now I'm gonna change this to level cleared something like this now let's select the text go to this rect tool and make it bigger so that we have more area to write whatever we want to all right and if you want you can go to this 2d mode to for easy editing and whenever you are done you can go back from this 2d mode so in this 2d mode it's easy to actually edit the UI elements so let's make it bigger something like this let's make it center on the vertical and on the horizontal axis as well so here we have the level cleared let's make the font bigger lump something like let's say 200 or 300 uh, I think make it let's make it 200 it's gonna be better so here we have our level clear text now what you can do is you if you want you can use any other font or if you have this font you can use this font as well if you have any other fonts you can use that as well so let's rename it to win text all right so here we have the win text objects so in my case here I have a font imported so here we have this font what I can do is I can use this font in this case so I'm gonna go to this font right click and go to create and I'm gonna go to this go to this text mesh pro and click on font asset so now as you can see it has created a new font asset for us which we can use with this text so I can go to my win text select my font asset and click here and select the font that I want to use here okay let's make it a little bit bigger so now I have this thing here which I want to appear whenever the level reloads or whenever the level gets cleared I can go ahead and change its color a little bit something like this you can want you can do this if you want to or you can simply ignore this if you don't wanna do this also you can select an outline I can give it an outline a little bit darker color with a little bit darker color something like this let's change the thickness something like this this is completely optional if you want if you prefer to do something like this you can do that if you don't want to do that simply go ahead and ignore this and do other things in your game 
so i think this one looks pretty good so whenever the level actually gets cleared or whenever the player wins i want this text to be appeared on the screen okay so by default i'm gonna go ahead and actually deactivate it now let's go ahead and open up our player controller one more time player controller script and here we need a reference to this win text object so here we're gonna say public game object win text and whenever the player wins the game whenever the collected coins is greater than seven we're gonna say win text dot set active to true all right so whenever the player wins he has collected all the coins we're gonna set the win text to true and then the player will win so let's save this go back to unity finally and now i'm gonna select my soccer ball go to the player controller and it is waiting for the win text so drag and drop the win text game object right here and now we have everything ready and let's play the game and see if we can win or not so from here you can simply make it maximized for a better view let's play and see if we can win so here we have the ball let's go ahead and collect the first coin let's go ahead and collect the second coin let's go and collect the third coin and be aware if we don't fall down and here is the third coin let's go here and collect the other coins as well where are the other coins i have no idea <laughs> let's go and find them so here we have another coin so probably three coins or four coins i have already got here I have another coin let's go ahead and collect it okay so I think we have only one left let's see how many we have left I guess we have only one or two left let's see and make sure you don't fall down here so here we have another one and we have another one at the end so let's go ahead and actually collect the final one and win the game okay so let's go ahead and find and collect this one and can i collect it okay so whenever we have collected all the coins as you can see level cleared is shown on our screen so we have won the game finally after building it all right so this way we have built the complete game i hope you really enjoyed and learned a lot of new things you can go to file build settings and make sure you have added the open scenes so that you can reload the scenes and then you can actually build them. If you want to build the scene, you can simply click on build to build it for Windows, Mac and Linux. If you want to build for WebGL, you can select the WebGL, click on switch platform and build and run to build it for WebGL and run it on the web. So this way you have learned how to build a completely working game in Unity in, within this short time. I have tried to explain all the things, but some of the things might be confusing because I was going very fast here. So this is Raja from Charger Games. I hope you really enjoyed and liked this video and I'm going to see you in another video very soon. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video start to finish. I hope you really enjoyed learning with me throughout the whole video. So if you want to learn more and build some more cool games, you can check out all my courses from the links given in the description of this video. If you want to learn about C Sharp, if you want to learn about building Android games, runner games, 3D endless runners, 2D racing games, zigzag car games, all that I have covered in my courses. So if you want to learn more about Unity, build some more complete projects start to finish, you can check out all my courses from the links given in the description of this video. So with that being said, I hope you really enjoyed learning with me and thank you so much and I'm going to see you in another video very soon.